and orcs in the deep places of the world. Everything out of the ordinary is to be reported. Fiery the angels fell. Deep thunder rolled around their shores. It may just be my imagination. Whatever it is that's watching, it's not human. We are all now programmed for perfect happiness. Perfect happiness. Perfect happiness. Perfect happiness. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. It's a hard world for little things. What we do in life echoes in eternity. You know, there was a time in this country when smart people were considered cool. Well, maybe not cool, but smart people did things like build ships and pyramids, and they even went to the moon. The Great Conjunction is the end of the world! Oh, the beginning? It was a church. Did you know that word? Yes, there were still churches when I was a child. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. You now belong to God, no longer to the devil. What you said just now is quite extraordinary. You are listening to Beyond Extraordinary with Natalie. Hey, welcome once again to Beyond Extraordinary. As always, this is Natalina, and I've got a really important show to bring you today, something that I'm quite passionate about, and uh, I, I hope that you're able to uh, glean some something from it. I think you will. I think it's going to be really uh, educational and interesting, so uh, we'll get into all of that in just a moment. Uh Merry Christmas, everybody. (laughs) Uh, For those of you who will be traveling to visit family, you know, my prayers are with you for safe travels. Uh, For those of you who are staying at home, uh, that's what we're doing this year. We're unable to travel at all for uh, the holiday, but we're going to just stay home and stay warm and just be together and, uh, you know, we'll go to church and that type of thing. It's a wonderful time of year. It's a wonderful time for worship and fellowship and and witnessing. You know, everybody's talking about Christmas right now. So by all means, whether they're approaching it from a uh, worldly perspective or a secular perspective, this is an awesome opportunity while pretty much universally everyone's talking about Christmas uh, for us to uh, take that time to talk to them about Jesus Christ and uh, what uh, his birth meant to the world because it led to his life and his death and ultimately his resurrection. So we can talk about what all of that means to people who have the word Christmas on their mind. What a great opportunity. What an awesome, awesome gift that we have uh, from the Lord that we can give to other people at this time of year. So if you're listening to this show and you want to share it with other people, and I think this might be one of those shows that you are going to want to share with people, um, you can grab the link, in, which will include the uh, the show plus the show notes at extraordinaryintelligence.com. Com. It'll be one of the very first uh, items on the site. Or you can click in the top taskbar where it says Beyond Extraordinary Podcast, and it'll be the most recent episode, unless you're listening to this a few months from now. <laughs> um, and then, uh, or you can certainly subscribe via iTunes. Uh, if you do subscribe via iTunes, please rate and review us. There is a link to iTunes in the right-hand sidebar and also in the show notes to this episode. We're also on Stitcher. You can rate and review us there if you like uh, and subscribe. Uh, those are some of the best ways to get the show. And then the best way to share the show is to just grab the link and share it on Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest. Um, we have a Twitter uh, and Facebook group and Pinterest and Google Plus for my own personal profile, all linked up in the right-hand sidebar of Extraordinary Intelligence. Dot com. So you can connect with me in a variety of different ways. Um, 
And then I just wanted to say thank you to everyone out there who has been uh, supporting this ministry through my uh, online boutique at ExtraordinaryBoutique.com where I sell my handmade jewelry. It's been really great this year. Uh, and uh, I, of course, I do this year round. I make jewelry year round and there's lots of stuff still there and there will be all kinds of new stuff, you know, almost every single day. So if you're uh, if you wanted to support the ministry and you wanted a little something in return, you can certainly check out ExtraordinaryBoutique.com. And uh, if you want to support this ministry, it just via a gift of any kind, you can do so uh, by clicking on the support tab at the top of the ExtraordinaryIntelligence.com website website. You'll see where it says support and through that portal you can uh, give a one-time gift or you can uh, sign up to have recurring monthly gifts uh, via PayPal and you know that just I can't even tell you how tremendously that helps uh, this ministry. It helps me. It helps my family. Uh, it's just it's it's incredible. So thank you to all of those of you who have done so or who will do so. Um, and of course, we always, always appreciate your prayers. So let's get into the show. Uh, let's get into the the meat of the discussion tonight. Well, this show is going to be really heavy on information and analysis. And what I wanted to do is start out by doing sharing something special with you. And that is the remarkable true story of one of my favorite and most enduring hymns of all time. O Holy Night, which tells the beautiful, beautiful story of what Christmas is, is really meant to be about. So uh, I, I'm going to share this story with you. And uh, I did write it in an article that was recently featured in Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural newsletter. It's also available on my website. I'll put the link in the show notes so that you can uh, take the full story and share it with your friends. Because as I say, it's a story that's nothing short of miraculous. So in 1847, a man named Placide Capo de Rochmar was the commissioner and inspector of wines in a small town in France. Known as an avid poet, Placide was approached by a priest to compose a poem for a Christmas service in Paris. Initially, he wasn't certain that he'd be able to live up to the task, but after reading the Gospel of Luke for inspiration, he envisioned what it might have been like to have lived in Bethlehem and witnessed the birth of Jesus. From there, he penned the now-famous words to Cantique de Noël, or O Holy Night. Upon delivering the poem in France, Capot determined that Cantique de Noël would be even more powerful if set to music. For help, he turned to the well-known composer of the time, Adolf Charles Adams. At first, Adams was reluctant to participate. As a Jew, the celebration of the Christian Savior didn't appeal to him. Still, something about the words of the poem inspired him, and thus he endeavored to compose an original score unlike anything that had been heard before. It only took Adams three weeks to complete the work, and it was immediately performed at a Christmas Eve celebration. Churches across France celebrated and embraced this amazing new hymn, and it became a popular staple for choirs to sing at Christmas time. However, Capot eventually left the Catholic Church. This information, combined with news that the music was written by a Jewish man, caused the Catholic hierarchy of France to ban the singing of Cantique de Noël, claiming it was too secular. Now, I have no idea how the worshipful lyrics to this song could ever be considered secular, but the church had spoken and the song was no longer part of traditional services. This didn't silence the song forever. Common folk continued to embrace it and refused to let the church bury it. They continued to sing Cantique de Noël in their homes and in social gatherings. O Holy Night had gone from a mainstream hymn to an underground hit. About ten years after the official attempt to bury the song in the church, uh, uh, by the church in France, Cantique de Noël found its way to the ears of an obscure American writer named John Sullivan Dwight. Dwight instantly felt moved by the lyrics and grand soaring score. He determined that American audiences had to hear it. Dwight felt that the song was the perfect marriage between the good news of the gospel and the freedom that Jesus represented. Dwight was an anti-slavery advocate, he was an ardent abolitionist, and he was overcome with the power of a particular verse, which reads, Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Dwight translated the lyrics of Cantique de Noël into English, renaming it O Holy Night, and published it in a magazine. 
The song found an audience in the American North where it was celebrated as an anthem for freedom. Meanwhile, the song continued to be celebrated by the common man in France and in various parts of Europe. It's said that during the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, a soldier jumped out of his trench in the middle of a firefight and sang three verses of Cantique de Noël while his fellow soldiers stared in amazement. Upon completion of the song, a German soldier boldly emerged from hiding and approached the Frenchman. It is said that after, for the next 24 hours, in honor of Christmas Day, both sides ceased fighting. From that time forward, Cantique de Noël and its English translation, O Holy Night, would become one of the most cherished hymns of Christmas around the world. In 1906, the only type of radios that existed were wireless transmitters that picked up code. On Christmas Eve of 1906, a 33-year-old university professor named Reginald Fezenden was tinkering in his office and proceeded to do something that had never been done before. He broadcast a human voice across the airwaves. Speaking into a microphone that he'd rigged himself, Fezenden read Luke chapter 2 from his Bible. As he uttered the following words, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Amazed radio operators on ships and over wireless code transmitters heard the gospel being read through their speakers. Those who heard those first words over the radio recall that they thought they were witnessing a miracle. Meanwhile, Fezenden had no idea who, if anyone, was hearing the broadcast. After completing his reading from the Gospel of Luke, he picked up his violin, sat close to the microphone, and played the familiar music to O Holy Night, making it the first song to ever be played over the airwaves. Since 1847, when a poet in France penned his poem to, inspired by Luke's gospel, O Holy Night it became a song that managed to unite common people across France, inspire Americans as it highlighted the sin of slavery and the freedom of Jesus Christ, unite soldiers on the battlefield, and break ground as the first song to ever be broadcast through a medium that would eventually spread the gospel all over the world. Indeed, it was a miracle. Isn't that just beautiful and inspiring and lovely? You know, as I said, this program is going to be so heavy on information and academic analysis that I just wanted to start the show with something simple. I I find it somewhat tragic that we even need to have this discussion about the legitimacy of the Christmas holiday and whether or not Christians should celebrate it. It's so basic in my mind that even a child should be able to understand why we set aside a day to remember the miraculous birth of Jesus. Today's people are not the first, of course, to ask the question, what is Christmas really all about? The Christian consensus used to just be as follows. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? 
Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Well, obviously we shouldn't rely on old cartoons for our theology, but Linus's reading of Luke chapter 2 in the Charlie Brown Christmas special from 1965, it contains everything we need to know about why the birth of our Lord is to be celebrated. So today's show, although it's kind of heavy, it's important. My guest and I will be delving pretty deeply into the realm of scholarship, specifically bad scholarship that surrounds the enduring but inaccurate meme which claims that Chris, the Christian celebration of Christmas is a pagan celebration with pagan roots and that Christians should not participate in this celebration. Such claims are not unique amongst cult offshoots of Christianity. Groups like Jehovah's Witnesses and The Way International have long made such claims, but those groups have largely kept to themselves without much desire to change Christian culture. However, in somewhat recent years, there's been a movement that has sought not only to exclude the Christmas celebration from their own worship, but they've become aggressive in their attempts to chastise more Orthodox believers for celebrating the birth of Christ on December 25th. The so-called Hebrew Roots Movement and other movements with similar belief structures would have us believe that Christmas is a strictly pagan celebration with roots that trace back to any number of false gods such as Osiris, Horus, Mithras, or Nimrod. Endless memes are shared online throughout this season uh, on Facebook and elsewhere that contain supposed scholarship proving the connection between Christmas and ancient pagan revelry. They alternately invoke Sol Invictus and Saturnalia, but all share one thing in common. They are all incredibly, deeply, and completely wrong. These pagan roots claims can almost universally be traced to a single source, that being the work of Presbyterian minister uh, named Alexander Hislop, who wrote a book in the mid-1800s called The Two Babylons. Although this work has been universally panned by legitimate scholars, with that both Christian and secular, the myths contained in this book have endured through the years, with other authors borrowing and expanding upon the false premises, creating this endless minefield of, of false information information and flawed history lessons, which have left really a lot of Christians confused and distressed, not knowing what to believe. So it's my prayer that this show will help to dispel some of the myths and set the record straight. Author and apologist Chris Putnam, who's a dear friend of mine and regular on this show, has devoted a lot of time and academic pursuit to this topic. He recently wrote a great article on his blog about the reasons why December 25th was selected as the date to celebrate the birth of Jesus and how that decision was anything but pagan in origin. Um, I'll include a link to that article in the show notes, but I want to share with you a quote from another article he wrote this one is titled uh, Christmas Trees Are Not Pagan, wherein he describes how Martin Luther used the lighted evergreen tree to demonstrate the light of God. And at the end of this article, Putnam says, Because we are not under Israelite ceremonial law, we are free to celebrate the birth of the Savior any day we please. It is safe to say that hardly anyone is thinking about pagan deities while performing Christ- Christian Christmas traditions. Most of the conspiracy theories give paganism too much credit. Paganism did not infect Christianity, but rather Christianity made paganism irrelevant. Now think about that for a moment. Christianity made paganism irrelevant. Amen. Why are so many Christians giving so much lip service to false gods when all the things Everything belongs to the one true God. If Christ came to free us from bondage, then why are some people so anxious to make us fearful that we might inadvertently be worshiping deities that don't exist? Worshiping our Lord in spirit and truth is never wrong, no matter what day it is. 
I want to make it clear that the, it is not my desire to chastise anyone who has chosen not to celebrate Christmas. Scripture clearly states that in, in Romans fourteen five, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. This is an important reminder for all sides of the discussion, and this program is not designed to promote Christmas as a day that Christians must celebrate. Rather, it's intended to rescue the Christmas celebration from the inaccuracies and falsehoods being promoted by folks who are genuinely misled by poor scholarship and unqualified historians. It's my opinion that since the heavenly hosts celebrated the birth of Jesus Christ, believers shouldn't be made to feel ashamed for doing so. All of the earth is God's. All all creation is his and for his glory. As my guest will illuminate during this interview, also, all time is God's as well. Satan doesn't get a special day. Pagans can't take a day away from God Almighty. All things and all time are his and can be and should be used for worship and praise. Amen? This show is not an apologetic for the cultural trappings of the holiday season, such as, you know, rampant consumerism and greed. We stand in opposition to that as well. But we refuse to accept that Christmas is a day to be avoided by believers, and the reasons are innumerable. I hope you'll find this discussion educational and edifying. My guest is Cliff Garner. He's a scholar and a historian with an impressive depth of understanding as to ancient cultures, early church, and history in general. He's a devout Christian and his passion for correcting historical inaccuracies, particularly as they pertain to the topic at hand. He's passionate and sincere. Cliff can be heard regularly on the awesome podcast like Flint. His depth of knowledge is such that it may take a couple listens to be able to fully absorb everything that he presents in the show today. But I'm going to include a list of sources that he's provided in the show notes that you can access at ExtraordinaryIntelligence.com for further research, which we encourage you to do. You know, this isn't the first time I've approached this particular topic. Uh, I wrote an article uh, last year uh, that was entitled Defending Christ the King, Refuting the Pagan Roots Lie. And it covers all a lot of the information that we're going to discuss in tonight's show. I will also link to that in the show notes so you can uh, avail yourself of that and, and share it with people. But I really hope that you enjoy tonight's show and that you gain some insight from it uh, to once and for all determine that this whole concept of the pagan roots of Christmas is inaccurate, flawed, and needs to stop. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive. discussed many times on this show and elsewhere, I haven't always been a devout Christian. In those years when I was lost in searching, there was pretty much one time per year when I could be persuaded to think about Jesus, and that time was Christmas. I could usually be convinced to go to church, and I would sing these beautiful hymns about Christ's miraculous birth, which would naturally lead me to thinking about his life and his death and his resurrection. I distinctly recall being moved to tears by some of these hymns and by pondering the nativity scene that I would be looking at and the entire birth narrative. I needed something to believe in, and there was that one time per year where I thought about the, the gospel. I credit some of those moments of awe and wonder to be what eventually opened my heart enough to accept in Christ as my Savior. So now, 
Imagine my shock as a believer when I started to come upon folks who claimed to follow the same Jesus that I did, but who told me in no uncertain terms that everything about Christmas, the entire celebration, was bad and pagan and sinful. Imagine even being told that it was not possible to please God by celebrating the birth of my Savior on this day. So all of my previous feelings of worshipful reverence during the Christmas holiday were apparently based upon lies and that my usage of things like a Christmas tree, candles, lights, all of that were dirty pagan symbols that pagans in antiquity used to worship, thereby making those symbols pagan, which made me an accidental pagan by proxy. Now, not wanting to displease the Lord, I initially bought into some of this stuff. I was a baby Christian and was really susceptible to suggestion by those who appeared to be more learned than me, and I conceded that they must be right. So as I've matured in my faith and become more diligent in my study, I can officially say that I reject the notion that Christmas is a time to be avoided by faithful Christians. In fact, I've become quite passionate about dismantling the disinformation that's arisen about the pagan nature of modern Christmas celebration, and thus, that is why I am doing this episode. So, joining me as a man I've come to respect for his scholarly pursuits in biblical history and history in general, as well as his passion for defending our faith, Cliff Garner is adept at discussing issues from theological and philosophical perspectives which makes him the perfect guest for tonight's discussion. Some of you may know Cliff from his works with Like Flint Radio, but if you don't know who Cliff is, I'm really happy to introduce you for this very special episode of Beyond Extraordinary. I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Cliff Garner. Cliff, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. You know, I, I know that this issue of the supposed pagan origins of Christmas and the um, the propensity that some groups have to sort of shame those of us who celebrate Christmas is something that you and I feel really strongly about. So I know that this is... A, I'm, I'm really pleased to have gotten you to be on the show today because I know that you can speak to some of the specifics of not only what these groups claim about Christmas, but really the truth behind the claims. And I think that's what I want to get into with this show tonight. But before I do any of that, I want you to kind of introduce yourself to the audience. Tell us a bit about yourself um, and why this issue is important to you. Well, uh, I I, I also kind of got caught up in the some of that that uh, thinking that uh, has come with, uh, really has come with a, a lot of uh, Alexander Hislop's teaching. Uh, he he wrote a book uh, called the uh, the two Babylons or, or the papal worship uh, uh, proved to be the worship of Nimrod and his wife. Really long title, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, it it's a it's a book that uh, a lot of us have uh, been in contact with. with um, uh, directly or or indirectly, and uh, we we've bought into uh, certain ideas that he was promoting. And uh, one of the problems with Mr. Hislop is that he's wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and, and and he he wrote it, uh, I think, in the 1850s, uh, I believe. And, uh, and so this was before they had even excavated Babylon. And he made a lot of claims uh, regarding uh, the uh, mythologies of uh, the Middle East, um, the different uh, historical uh, aspects of uh, the Middle East as well. And, he, and he, what he did is he kind of mishmashed them all together and, uh, and made up a lot of it as he went along, uh, really. And... Uh, the reason it just keeps hanging on and hanging on, I I, I think uh, actually it's more spiritual than it is uh, uh, clear as a uh, an objective fact. I, I have a feeling that uh, because there's so much false information in there that, that the demons really do play with it. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it, kind of like the uh, the protocols of the uh, uh, learned elders of Zion. It, it, this is uh, this is one of these uh, documents that uh, has the the ring of truth, but it has no substance. It it just uh, the the truth in it is lacking. It doesn't have any. Right. And and, and Mister Hislop, I, I don't want to. I don't want to ascribe evil where stupidity is a possibly a better uh, reason, uh, but 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 evil often comes from stupid things. And I mean, we 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 talk sometimes about the uh, the banality of uh, of evil, and uh, and it is it's banal. I mean, it, it would be funny if it weren't so tragic. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I, I think this is kind of the case here. Um, the Hislop, Hislop didn't know what they would find later. He misinterpreted a lot of uh, what was in there. And, and, and also his practices of exegesis from, uh, from historical sources, you know, his hermeneutic as, as, a, as a scholar uh, was very poor. And he would, he would take uh, parts of, uh, of, uh, of what he was trying to quote and he would throw out the rest of it, you know, so he would pull it out of context. Uh, he was not a very good scholar. So, so you, you have a lot of people who are defending Hislop, uh, uh, even now. Uh, you have Lou White, uh, who wrote, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, it, it, it comes up by the bombs, right? Oh, fossilized customs. That's it. Right, right. Yep. Customs. And, and, and he's the, uh, right now the foremost uh, scholar, <laughs> such as he is, mm-hmm. of, uh, of uh, Hislop. Uh, it was a fellow named Ralph Woodrow who, uh, who was told that uh, his information was bad. And uh, ch- they, he, he was challenged to go back and reexamine it, and he did. And, uh, and and my my respect for Woodrow was just immense. I mean, the guy the guy was making a ton of money off of this, and he went back and looked and found out that the, his critics were correct. Hislop was terrible, mm-hmm. and 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 he found he found where he made all these not only mistakes but actually jiggled jiggered with the truth and uh, tried to force fit it into what he wanted to say. Uh, that uh, that tends to uh, put Hislop in an even worse light than just saying that uh, he didn't know better. Uh, and, and, and in which case, uh, God's going to have to uh, uh, actually judge him uh, for uh, right. for what he's done because what he has done is uh, tragic. It's truly tragic. Uh, and he he's slandering the Catholic Church, but you know the thing is, is that there are real problems with uh, with Catholicism. Mm-hmm. But telling lies about what the Catholic belief is is never going to address the real problems. Right. It can't possibly do that. So right. so I, I, justifying what Hislop did is is almost impossible. And and the, it's not for us to do anyway. I, I mean, the guy the guy uh, was 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 a, pre, a Presbyterian minister. I, I was I was a Presbyterian myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I feel for him, but you know, at the same time, it's like you can't do that. There's something right. you can't do. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, when you were talking, I happen to agree with you that there is a spiritual problem here because I feel like, you know, before I was a devout Christian, I went through a phase where I was very much, um, I was very much rebellious to Christianity, and I kind of, you you remember that whole section of that movie zeitgeist where it was trying to debunk jesus right. and saying that he was like an amalgam of all of these other dying and rising messiah figures you know i bought into that which is yeah. all hislop it all traces back to hislop and yeah. i bought into so much of that and i would memorize the claims and i would spout them off because i was ignorant really and i was just parroting what i was hearing and reading from these sources 
So what I discovered then as a Christian is that these folks who are um, coming against Christmas celebration, they are using the same source material as atheists who are trying to debunk Jesus Christ himself. And, And so to me, that's beyond coincidence. And I would categorize that as being a spirit a spiritual issue at play, especially when you consider they're coming from the same sources. And one thing you mentioned um, that I want you to drill down on a little bit, uh, you said that the people are uh, revisiting Hislop's work, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And I find Mm -hmm. that a lot of people in what the so-called Hebrew roots movement, because they really are the tip of the spear as far as trying to, uh, claim that Christmas is this horrible pagan celebration. Um, uh, They parrot what Hislop claims, but they almost, I think in a lot of cases, they don't even realize that they don't even know who Hislop is. At this point, the water has become so muddy that no one is able to trace it back to its original source. And so they think they've happened upon this, you know, wellspring of new information and revelation, but really it all traces back to Hislop. So uh, talk about a little bit about um, some of, some of these claims, like when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about Ralph Woodrow, some of the things that he came forward and said that he realized was wrong about Hislop's scholarship was, for example, uh, Nimrod was born on December 25th and round decorations on Christmas, Christmas trees uh, were, were designed to honor the sun God and all of this stuff, you know, talk about some of these claims in in Hislop's work as specifically pertaining to, uh, Christmas celebration, especially Nimrod, because that is nobody seems to even know where they're getting their information from on that issue anymore. Well, well let, let me just digress just a little bit for just a very short period here, and it, it, mm-hmm. that, I think this might tie more of it together. Uh, yeah. One of the things, and, and I wish I would have said something earlier because it, 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 would, it would have been, like I say, it would have tied some of that together. Uh, because you're talking about uh, that that movie, uh, what, what's it called? Uh, Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and and the the a lot of that information is from Hislop directly, but there's also right. uh, information that that the secondhand Hislop through other people, and yeah. we're we 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 get into that. We're talking about people like uh, Sir James Fraser with his Golden Bow. We're talking about uh, Robert Graves with his white goddess. Okay, and and we get into these things and then things that have derived from it since then. Uh, a, a lot of this has been a misapplication of comparative mythology. Okay, and, and, mm-hmm. and that's really where a lot of this kind of comes in. And and, and, uh, and people like Frazier weren't so much proving something that they were finding from their research as they were imposing on the material a, a, a presupposition of their own. Mm-hmm. And and the, this is this is where you get the people talking about the dying and God, uh, dying and rising gods and all this stuff. And and, and, uh, and, and you know it it uh, it, it goes into uh, even goes into things like. Uh, uh, Jung and uh, his his archetypes and stuff like that. I mean, it, it really does infect all this. And, right. and, and, and note that this is the Protestant world that's affected by it. Mm-hmm. And it's because the Catholic world doesn't even listen to that because they know it's such nonsense. Right. And and then that's see that's part of the problem. That's part of the embarrassment of this. And it's 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 the Protestant world that ended up being more infected by it. And 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 uh, anyway, it, but it led to certain uh, a- a- asegetical uh, techniques in which people were proving their point by marshalling the evidence to uh, fit what they wanted it to fit into, and if it didn't fit quite right, they'd hammer it into place. 
So, so you have a lot of that, and and this is uh, this has entered into the West in a big way, and now now we have on top of uh, this whole thing from the Hislop uh, uh, angle, we have a a, a kind of a, a Dan Brown New Age uh, kind of mishmash added to it with the Holy Blood Holy Grail lies, mm-hmm. and uh, and and those are those are established in a similar way, but it, but but the. Uh, but that goes more back to uh, uh, the conspiracy theories that have uh, you know just been everywhere in Western culture. Uh, so so yeah, we we we, uh, we have all this hip stuff, and and uh, so when we start to examine it and really compare it to real history, we find that it really doesn't work very well. And and you know you you take uh, Fraser's uh, dying and rising gods and. Uh, and all that, and and then you have uh, Graves who believes, okay, uh, I I'm trying to prove this uh, this goddess culture that that uh, was this great culture that was uh, prior to the end of the European culture, and then next thing you know, you got Maria Gimbutas uh, adding her little two two bits in on that as well. And, and 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 they're all they're you know they're all trying to put in their own little theories, but the one thing that they all agree on is they don't like Christianity the way it is. Yeah. And and, and so they have to assault it, and uh, and and that just there's just no end to it. I mean, the Buddhist uh, lumps uh, lumps God the Father in with all the other sky gods, you know, the, the sky gods of the Kurgans. Uh, did did you ever watch a uh, 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 Highlander. Yep. yep. You remember the Kurgan? I do. Yeah, the really ugly guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, he the Kurgans were the, uh, the were the culture that came out of the steppes of the Ukraine into Europe, and they brought the horse and uh, Indo-European language with them. But they also brought uh, metallurgy, and uh, the Bronze Age was uh, partly their responsibility. And, uh, and and from there, the use of bronze spread down into actually spread into uh, some of the greater civilizations uh, down in uh, Sumeria and uh, Israel and uh, the Hittites and all that. You know, the Middle East. Uh, that uh, the the Kurgan culture was uh, was barbarian, but but they had uh, they had a couple of advantages. They made better weapons, and uh, they also rode horses. So, so that that uh, that that's where that that comes from, and uh, and Maria Gambuda, so she was brilliant, by the way, uh, uh, one of the great linguists of, of the world, and uh, one of the great archaeologists. And the Kurgans were uh, these uh, burial mounds that their that their masters, the lords of the Kurgans, used to build after they died, and they would have mm-hmm. them and. Sometimes their wife, uh, the, the practice of suti. It, it, it's uh, the practice where uh, they would kill the, the wife with the husband after he died. Oh, and mm-hmm. and, and it, that that's that still happens in India, uh, although it's a, it's a dying culture. Um, but but that, they practice that, and uh, and that that's uh, that's part of where that comes from. Um, now now. With Woodrow, I, I, you really have to admire the man. He it took a lot of guts for him to not only go back and re-examine his own work, but to find a wanting the way he did, mm-hmm. and to to the extent that he went to uh, of rejecting that that uh, his own work and the money that came with it. Right, uh, because it is it has cost his uh, his uh, uh, ministry quite a bit because he would not continue to print that book uh, about right. uh, Babylon. Uh, that that's that's some real integrity. Yeah, and we should establish that Ralph Woodrow uh, he was one who was a supporter of Hislop's theory, yeah. went so far as to write his own book called uh, Babylon Mystery Religion, and it echoed m- the scholarship of Hislop. And when his- when Woodrow was uh, compelled to re-examine that work, 
uh, he did. He found it completely wanting, and he recanted his stance on those pagan roots of Christianity beliefs, and ha- has since pulled his book out of print. So he he refuses to reprint it. He refuses to make another dime off of it because well, uh, he, it, it, it's just so filled with errors. I mean, some of the things that he lists as being in error are uh, like the one I mentioned where uh, Nimrod was born on December 25th. Right. He also uh, comes against the this concept that uh, Christmas is uh, based on sun god worship. He comes uh, against the idea that um, uh, that uh, Mithras <laughs> and that whole cult <laughs> yeah. is is uh, is what Christmas is based on. You know, Hislop. He really, if you take a look at what he wrote, he really is an all-you-can-eat smorgasbord of oh. just like throwing things against the wall. <laughs> well, this is what Christmas means, yeah. or this is no wait, wait a minute. This is what it's based on, and this is who Jesus. You know what I mean? He yeah. just throws oh. all of this stuff against the wall. And what's unfortunate, as I said, is that there. These unsubstantiated teachings are things that there are actual people who claim to follow Jesus are now claiming uh, as their defense for why we shouldn't engage in something uh, like Christmas. And it, 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 I don't think they even realize. I was telling you before we started recording. Right. One of the, one of the things that often is claimed by people who uh, who 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 are the, in the anti Christmas crowd is they'll say don't don't listen to me just Google it right. just go to Google and type in you know Nimrod Christmas or Osiris Christmas or Mithras Christmas and you will do your own research and that is just ridiculous because this. Hislop stuff is so pervasive that if you Google something like that, you're going to come up with a million results that seem (laughs) to claim that Hislop is right. But then when you get down into digging it, you can see that they're using the exact same language. They're using the exact same phrasing to the word, which proves that they're all parroting one another and no one is really no one is really realizing anymore because it's almost kind of gotten lost in the shuffle that all of this traces back to the two Babylons. It really is like the source and it's just gotten so buried. Yeah. 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 And I, I, uh, I carry, when we were talking earlier, I characterize that as a a echo chamber and, Mm -hmm. and, and it really is. Uh, And, and, and they're all just repeating the same stuff. And, and and if you look at, uh, if you look at, uh, Fraser and, uh, and uh, 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 graves, uh, they're often repeating each other too, and mm-hmm. and they're repeating Hislop. And Hislop came first. And, and notice that Hislop's a Scottish, and he's mm-hmm. a Scottish uh, Scottish minister. Uh, Fraser's only a few years later, but he's also Scottish, and and, and mm-hmm. he's he's an anthropologist. And and so so you have you have all this, this very similar uh, ideas and stuff that are getting spread around. And, uh, and so, so it, it, it's it's one of the things. That the, the reason why it's pervasive is that there's these other sources that that have uh, come pretty much from the same place, and right. and they, uh, they 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 Fra- Graves had to be aware of Fraser because Fraser was one of the great uh, anthropologists of his time, and 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 Graves was right there. Uh, he he served in uh, World War One. He was one of the great poets of that time period, and uh, mm-hmm. he was friends with Sassoon and all those guys. Uh, but but he he also formed his theories because he took that that God, dying and rising God theory uh, that that uh, Fraser talked about, in which the the uh, king would be sacrificed. The king was a sacrificial figure that he would reign for a, a, a short period of time. I think it was a I think it was a two and a half years or something. And, it has mm-hmm. to do with lunar cycles, and, and uh, he he said that, and that Grace took that idea, and, and he 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 posited that these kings would reign uh, under under essentially a um, um, a feminine um, hierarchy, and, and and he he his whole thesis on the the white goddess is based on that, 
so so you, you you really get all this interplay between them all and and, and, and so when we look at this me- this method of a uh, of inter uh, you know intertextual uh, examinations of uh, of uh, uh, the different mythologies and the way they put them together it, it, it it's really kind of haphazard but they're looking for things in common and that way they they tie them together and then they they they, they would actually uh, just like Hislop did create a story out of it and a great especially yeah. uh, the guy was good I mean don't get me wrong there, there's some things in there that are really good but but when it came down to uh, his etymology he made it all up mm-hmm. the part, part of what Graves did okay is, is he would see a picture right and he would say okay there's Zeus is it Zeus well maybe maybe not you know and, and, mm-hmm. and he would he would interpret this picture and try to smash it together with the myth. Sometimes right. it isn't exactly a perfect match, so he'd bend it around to, to his his predetermined interpretation of the myth to try to make it work out. Right. And and that, see that's also what Fraser does with his dying and rising gods. He might. Yeah. Him. So. And it's interesting because you you touched on something when we were talking earlier. Um, you know, you you lived in Turkey for a time and were exposed to a lot of uh, fascinating history that those of us here in the states maybe uh, aren't privy to. And one yeah. of the things that you told me that I thought was really interesting, um, you know, one of the main stories that ties. Uh, Nimrod to Christmas is this concept that Nimrod's wife was Semiramis right. and that she um, uh, I'll, I'm going to screw up the legend but somehow it was that she uh, rose from a the stump of an evergreen tree that that, <laughs> she, that, that Nimrod arose from the stump of oh. an evergreen tree and that is how the origin of the Christmas tree came about but you had an interesting take on the fact that uh, Semiramis and Nimrod were not even contemporary yeah they're not contemporary <laughs> like, yeah, which is which is <laughs> uh, would make uh, poor Nimrod's life uh, very miserable. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Twelve hundred years for his wife to be born. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, Samiramis um, was a, was a person we can prove existed. Okay. Mm-hmm. And Nimrod, we 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 know that he is somebody because the Bible bothers right. to mention it, mm-hmm. but. He's at the time of the flood, and the flood was probably about 3100 BC, roughly. And mm-hmm. that uh, that he would be born sometime after the flood, and then he'd become the first king. So, so maybe 2800 or something like that. And Sir Iramis, okay. uh, she's she's a, an Assyrian queen uh, of, of circa 800 BC, and. Uh, we we know that she exists. Her name was Samuramat, and that mm-hmm. uh, that uh, I, I've, I I showed my mother. I made a real point of showing it to the uh, Stella because it, it's it's pretty remarkable. It has a it has a, a you know all the all the writing you know it's a cuneiform and stuff, and uh, and and what it says is that uh, that her son um, uh, what is his name Samshi. Uh, she was the wife of Shamshi Adad V of Syria, and he existed, and the son, Adad Nirari III, uh, also existed, and he may have been the one that, uh, that uh, Jonah spoke, uh, prophesied against, mm-hmm. and repented, uh, which I just find really fascinating in and of itself. Uh, it, it really is. Yeah, you know that's the thing. What do we need all this uh, nonsense for? I mean, the nonsense. Okay, it sounds kind of cool and it boggles our mind for a little while, and it really messes us up. Mm-hmm. Strip away the nonsense, and what you got left is even more incredible in some ways. Yeah, it's way cooler than trying to somehow connect her to Nimrod, who was. Uh, you know, thousand years <laughs> previous right. to her 
being alive. It it makes no sense. But, you know, the, the problem is, as I said, this myth gets repeated and repeated and repeated right. to the point where people have their heads so full of this being a reality that when you try to break it down for them and say, no, this this entire legend can't be true, and here's why. Right. Because they didn't even live at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, not even close. It's not even like she could have been just a lot older than Nimrod. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no feasible way that they existed at the same time. And no. therefore, you have have to throw out the entire story about how she rose him from a evergreen tree because if they didn't live at the same time then that can't be true right. like that is something that someone many years later made up and everyone just thinks that it's true exactly and and and, and, it, and it's garbage uh, that, that's that's mm-hmm. the bad part and, and right just because somebody wants something to be true doesn't mean it is see right. our will <laughs> <laughs> has has uh, certain legitimate applications, you know, where we don't want to do something, but we should, and we use our will to get up and do it. Right. But I, I have a feeling that all this will worship that goes on with uh, with trying to abide by all in all pieces of the law, mm-hmm. that the will is getting over overworked up, and then now we're talking about something that's almost thelemite in it in its uh, uh, nastiness. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, you're, you're looking at something that, that reeks of Crowley. Yeah. Uh, because people will it to be so. They they will do everything to make it so. But that doesn't change that's history. True. History is what it is. We shouldn't yeah. mess with that. Uh, oh, it's just ridiculous. Uh, you, you have Lou White that, that tries to justify his work by saying, well, even if Smyramus was 800 AD, uh, B.C. and Nimrod was 3100 uh, B.C., uh, still she's a type. <laughs> and it's like, a type of what? Mm-hmm. A type of myth that you would refuse to let go of? Right. It's like when you build a Jenga tower and you pull that one piece out that collapses the whole thing, but somebody is sitting there trying to hold it yeah. <laughs> with their arms, trying to hold it in place they're so it doesn't fall piece down. In their hand and they're saying, see, I've got it. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. And, you know, That's the other the one. I mean, if he had a wife, I think. I think if if she did something that was significant enough and it was important enough, it would have been in the Bible because I think God cares mm-hmm. enough for us to put it there. Absolutely. If it was so crucial for us to make this connection between Nimrod and this solar worship that would come many years later mm-hmm. that would deceive the whole of Christianity, you would think that that would be spoken of in Scripture, sure. but it's not. Sure. It's not even hinted at. Sure. Well, when we were talking about uh, the uh, pictures that uh, the graves use. Well, well, well mm-hmm. uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Hislop does that, too. And, and I have uh, the Loiseau Brothers uh, edition of uh, the two Babylons. It's, it's a little bit old. I, I bought that back when, uh, when uh, Dr. Dean Scott was... Uh, Still, uh, still preaching on TV, mm-hmm. and and it has a picture here on page ninety eight, and it shows a snake wrapped around a, a stump, and yeah. uh, it says "Tiriorum" on the top, uh, which really doesn't amount to much, and it shows in the background a palm tree, and, uh, and oh, I'm not even sure what that thing is. But but uh, but this is the kind of kind of thing that, uh, that 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 he did, and and it says here in the print. And I'm I'm going to read what it, what he it wrote here. Uh, it talks about uh, Zeroashta, Zoroaster, right? How Zoroaster was was Nimrod back in the original time, right? Uh, putting him uh, about two thousand years ahead of when he was supposed to be, but because he could he could break the name down, Zero Ashta, the seed of the woman, mm-hmm. right? So he's 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 uh, he's showing that this name means something different than it did. 
uh, which uh, name also signified in Ignijana, born of fire. Ignijana. Okay, mm-hmm. born of fire. He has to enter the fire on Mother Night, that he may be born the next day out of it as the branch of God. And you see what he's doing here. He's he's bringing all this stuff and mashing it all together, right? Right. Uh, or the tree that brings all divine gifts to men, okay? And he keeps going. He says, but why, it may be asked, does he enter the fire under the symbol of a log, okay? So now he's wanting to show how how uh, this this whole Nimrod mishmash becomes the Yule log, right? Right. And uh, he says, uh, to understand this, it must be remembered. And I went back to page 97 there. And it's towards the end of the paragraph, but I, it's kind of where I uh, underlined it. And I'm sorry, I, I should have gone another sentence before that because it explains why the Yule log is put in the fire. Okay, so at any rate, it says, but it must be remembered that the divine child born at the winter solstice was born as a new incarnation of the great God after that God had been cut in pieces on purpose to revenge his death upon his murderers. Now the great God cut, and they have a, uh, uh, thing to look down it says see prior uh, footnote <laughs> uh, now the great God cut off in the midst of his power and glory was symbolized as a huge tree stripped of all its branches symbol of the life of restoring and that's why he has this figure down here of that of that from a coin of the serpent around the stump right mm-hmm. uh, and it says here uh, stripped of all its branches and cut down almost to the ground. Okay, so that's what that's a good description of a stump. But the great serpent, the symbol of life restoring, Asclepius, twists itself around the, uh, the dead stalk, right, of the stump. And lo, mm-hmm. at its side, up sprouts a young tree, and there's another tree in the background, of an entirely different kind, and that's a palm tree. Uh, that is destined never to get cut down by hostile power, even the palm tree, the well-known symbol of victory. The Christmas tree, as has been stated, is generally at Rome a different tree, even the fir. But the very same idea was implied in the palm tree, uh, implied, implied in the palm tree was implied in the Christmas fir. You, you see what he's doing? Mm-hmm. He's putting two things together, trying to explain this this story. And he's he's saying, but because he's put these two things together, that these two things are connected. There's no connection to me. He's not explaining why there's a connection at all. Yeah, yeah. But but it's presented in such a way that that it's compelling to the reader. Sure. Because it 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 sounds so. I'm hearing, I'm hearing a little bit of echo on my end, end here, but it, it sounds, sounds so, so uh, scholarly, scholarly well, I'll say. Like, like read you it. read it and you yeah. think, this man he, really did his he, research he, and he is presenting he, to me this, this uh, compelling, compelling set of facts. But, but really, it, it it's two, two unrelated things, things that he's trying to make into uh-huh. a story. A story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that isn't really All true. All he's doing is, it, it's called juxtaposition. You're putting two things together. Mm-hmm. There's a connection and moving on and going on to the next fact. And, and he's got all right. these factoids. He's got all these footnotes. He's got tons of footnotes. And they look good until you start investigating them and finding out that some of them are completely false. And, 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 and what he's saying is completely false. I mean, look, look at this again. I mean, uh, it says the Christmas tree, as has been stated, because he talks about it earlier, uh, was generally... Uh, at, at Rome, a different tree, even the fir. So it was a fir tree in Rome, right? right but right. the very same idea, as was implied in the palm tree, was it applied in the Christmas fir. Now, what is he talking about? <laughs> How do we apply a palm tree from a, Chris, from a fir tree uh, for Christmas time? And that, now the rest of the sentence uh, keeps going. It, it says... Uh, for that, uh, uh, well, back up again. Uh, the Christmas tree, as has been stated, generally at Rome, a different tree, even the fir, which is saying that the fir is the tree they're talking about, 
Uh, but the very same idea, as was implied in the palm tree, was implied in Christmas fir, which, as we, we've noted, makes absolutely no sense. There's no reason to make that assumption. And, and he doesn't speak about it earlier. Uh, right. And then he goes forward and says, For that covertly symbolized the newborn God as Baal Bareth, the Lord of the Covenant. And thus shouted forth the perpetuity and everlasting nature of his, of his power, now that after having fallen before his enemies, he has risen triumphant over them all. Okay, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll double back here in a minute and go back to his, his primary thesis as, as, a, as a story, because that's really what it is. Uh, but, but keep going here for just a minute, because uh, we have other fish to fry right at the moment. Uh, it says here, uh, therefore, the 25th of December, the day that was observed at Rome, as the day when the victorious God reappeared on earth, was held as a Natalis Invicti Solus, the birthday of the unconquered sun. But it was never na- mentioned as that in any written thing in existence. It was never mentioned it from Roman times as that. Although that that's what would be implied, and if we had something that said uh, Natalis Invicti Solus explicitly and said December 25th, we would have proof. Now, what they do have is called, uh, or hang on just a second, uh, is called the uh, uh, calendar uh, of uh, two, 273. And it actually is a calendar from the year 554, 354, but it, uh, here we go, chron- chron- chronography of 354. And it, it, it is a calendar, and it says here, and I'm, I'm looking right at it. Now, I, I can give you a link for that uh, if you put pu- pu- mm-hmm. pu- those links. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can yep. give you a little yep. uh, and, and, and if you go down to the month of December, it's a, it'll say in Latin, Mensis de Chamber. Uh, and, uh, and under the 25th, it will say N Invicti CM XXX. So that's uh, Natal- uh, Natalis Invicti, birthday of the sun. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, birthday of the unconquered they right. don't say unconquered son see Sol Invictus was not necessarily the only Invictus uh, I, I, I would in fact uh, cite this book uh, Paul Stevenson's Constantine it's uh, one of the more recent uh, uh, biographies of Constantine the Great and he mm-hmm. goes into great detail talking about how what you're talking about is probably uh, probably either a an, an emperor or his patron god. And if we if we go back to uh, Aurelian, okay, this is one of the reasons why they say that uh, Constantine believed in uh, Sol Invictus. You know, and they 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 wave this one around a lot, uh, but. Aurelian was the unconquered one. To follow what I'm saying here, yeah, mm-hmm. he defeated uh, Zenobia, the queen of uh, of Palmyra, who was a huge threat, one of the, one of the largest threats to the whole empire in history. And he defeated her in battle, and supposedly announced some games. Okay. And then, then that's what this would be. If this is the, the actual birthday of the sun, and there's reasons why people think it is, then, then mm-hmm. fine. But this is still too late to show that the Christians adapted this to their to their uh, to their celebrations to to uh, overtake a pagan holiday. Right. What it does show is that maybe, and, and, and we're not exactly sure that this is necessarily so, 
that maybe what Aurelian was trying to do was trying to co-opt a Christian holiday that was already being celebrated, which would which goes to a question that modern scholars are asking now uh, about the demographics of Rome at the time. Was the Eastern Empire more Christian than they originally thought? Hmm. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it, it actually ties into the concept of mithra worship i believe because there there's this uh similar uh train of thought if if you can't get nimrod to stick <laughs> let's go <Yeah. laughs> let's that's move on to mithra uh, well you know that's that's the way this whole thing works and, and it's and it's right. one of the reasons why it's like all these tentacles keep coming out mm-hmm. is because what what uh, Mr. Hislop did is he just took every mythology in the world and stuck them all together. Right. And and, and his assumption is is that all of them go back to Nimrod. So every god goes back to Nimrod. I mean, he's got Mars, he's got Jupiter, he's got Saturn. Mm-hmm. Who's he missing? And, <laughs> yeah, and ultimately, he's got Jesus. Yeah. And he takes Jesus... And puts him in this same camp as all of these other supposed sun gods. And that's what's so troubling to me that's... is because when you have people who proclaim to believe in Jesus or Yeshua or whatever they want to call him, when you have these people who proclaim to be believers, it is unbeknownst to them, they're pulling from the same source material that would say mm-hmm. that Jesus is Mithras, is Osiris, is Horus, is Nimrod. I think I think that this is where we would come to where if Hislop knew what he was going to, to cause, I think that mm-hmm. he would have repented of everything that he did. Right. Because he was a Trinitarian, for one. And 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 he gets cited for by by a lot of these folks in the new age, the the new age movement for one, but also Gnostics, neo Gnostics will cite him, and uh, right. and also uh, so so do the uh, the holy uh, the the uh, the uh, Hebrew roots uh, they they cite him too, all to deny the Trinity, and and yeah. and this is this. It's not something that he wanted to have happen. He believed in the Trinity. He believed in Jesus. But he also was attacking the Catholic Church, and he was trying to show how the Catholic Church didn't worship the same Jesus. Right. So it, instead of proving what he was trying to prove, he ended up proving something that's been used against the Church. Right. And and I, I think he would have repented of this. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a group uh, that they, they're anti-Trinitarian. Uh, uh, they're called the Christadelphians. Mm-hmm. And uh, they they, uh, they also tend to agree with that assu- that, that 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 analysis I just gave. That that they they in fact they tell their own people don't use don't use Hislop. He's bad history. I mean they're very objective about it. And, mm-hmm. and in fact, probably more so than than any of the Hebrew roots people. Uh, and 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 really also those of us that criticize him too. I mean they really. They really did a very good analysis of Hislop and where the problems with him lie. And they, they also explained that his intent was not to, to, to wreck the Trinity, but rather to show that the Catholics believed in a different Trinity. See, it, and, and, and that's the thing where he's still wrong. There, there, there's a point at which the Catholic Church did preserve uh, good doctrine. Mm-hmm. There's also a point at which they undermine good doctrine by tradition. This is where we need to really start to to start focusing and saying this is where they're wrong, this is where they're right. I, instead of taking something like like this this nonsense from Hislop and and just throwing it all around the room and making a real big mess of things, uh, we need we need to actually objectively look at what what they've done right and also what they've done wrong. And, and and criticize them where they where they're out of line. Maybe they'll come around one day. You know, I mean, you know, it, it didn't work for Luther, <laughs> but but maybe, right, right. maybe you know, you know, there's good people on both sides of most issues. 
Mm-hmm. And and uh, we we don't need to to beat everybody up all the time, you know. I mean, there, there there's a time and place for everything, and 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 being reasonable and sitting down and thinking, hey, look, this is this is good, this is not, you know. There 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 should be a point where we can at least discuss it, uh, but there's no discussion anymore with people that that want to just destroy everything about about Christmas. It's it's a it's a it's a scorched earth policy here. Right. And, you know, it's interesting when we th- when we when we take the concept of December 25th and, mm-hmm. and we try to extract all of the nonsense from Hislop and, and his followers and his parrots and the people who have expanded upon his work. Um, when we when we extract that and then we start looking at actual history mm-hmm. uh, and we start looking at what the early church actually did with regard to. Uh, creating December 25th as the day that the birth of Jesus would be celebrated, it's interesting to note, this is from some of my research, that it actually uh, was a lot more complicated to come to that date than to just say, oh, well, you know, a bunch of pagans um, (laughs) celebrate this day, so let's just take that away from them. I mean, really, there were the bishops of Rome and various Mm -hmm. scholars of the time who heavily debated whether or not this legitimately was the day that Jesus was born. But there were other traditions throughout the world that used different days. You know, some uh, adhered to um, Epiphany as the, you know, around January, early January as the birth of Christ. And so there's all of this going into it. But ultimately, the question is, if we cannot put our finger on the specific date mm-hmm. what is, what is the reason to claim that we shouldn't celebrate Christ's birth on any given day right. you know what is you know there are those who would say that it is wrong to celebrate his birth on a day unless it is unless we can prove and confirm that it is the actual day right. but you know this has been hotly debated throughout the centuries right and really, is it so important to know that we have the exact day nailed down, or is it just worshiping in spirit and truth on a day that has been sort of designated for that purpose? Right, and, 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 and you, that's a that's a beautiful way to put it, right there. Well, Should we do it any day? Is it is it fair game, or do we take mm-hmm. the name the day that has been designated? You know, that's right. been pointed to as a sign of it, and mm-hmm. the, that's a good question. Um, although I, I think that when you look at God and uh, the gospel and, and everything, the way that we've been given it, that God is a loving God and not a vengeful God towards us who who have repented and become His children. Mm-hmm. That uh, I don't think we should worry so much about God's wrath. Uh, yeah. And and is God a wrathful God? Well, yes, He has wrath, and that's not a not a nice thing to be in front of. Mm-hmm. But by the same token, is God merciful? Yes. Yes. And. The, this is this is really where we start to say that the people of the 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 Hebrew roots movement worship a different God. The nature of God is different. God God is going mm-hmm. to sit there with his little checkbook out. And he's going to tick off everything we do wrong. Right. Is that the nature of God? Can God do that? Yes, he can. Does he do it to us? No. Now, when we start looking at the 25th as possibly being the date, there, there, there are good reasons why they chose the date, although we might not agree with them today. Mm-hmm. And are they wrong about choosing the date? You know, we, we, we do have this issue. I mean, it's it's and it's right. it's it is worth talking about. Why did they choose that time? It's because they chose it. They chose it long before 
uh, uh, Aurelian came up as the, as the uh, as the emperor. Uh, he he was the emperor in 274. They were writing about this in the, uh, what 130. Mm-hmm. I, I think the first uh, the first people were talking about it in 130. I mean that's 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 uh, that's 140 years, 45 years later. Right. So so to say that it was a pagan holiday, let, let's see some proof that there was a pagan holiday prior to 274. There's there's no calendar that mentions this until the, the one in 354 that repeats the information from, from uh, Aurelian's time. Right. And, and even then, they can't prove that it, 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 that who the Invictus is. Now, now we know that our, with Aurelian... His patron god was Saul Invictus, okay? We do know that. So if he's talking about Saul Invictus' birthday being that day, and and he's establishing something on that day, then he's the first one to establish it. Right. right. Now, you know, everybody's like, well, it's the solstice of the sun. Well, so what? That doesn't mean that the Greco-Romans celebrated those days uh, the solstice in the summer or in the winter is being significant to them religiously. They're, they they do have uh, the same calendar has games. It says Ludi, right? And and, and you can see it on the uh, on the calendar uh, for the eighth of August. Uh, there's another set of games on the the twenty eighth of August. Uh, and there's a there's a third set of games on another date. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Possibly. Yeah. And here here it is. Uh, the date of Christ's birth, and it says this was originally published by the Bible League Quarterly in October December 1965. It's by a guy named David J. Gibson. It's available online at Nabataeanet, and and it says. Uh, Says here, uh, when most of time was come, God sent forth His Son. When Saint Paul penned these words, he emphasized God's choice of the time of Christ's first advent. He seemed to have no doubt uh, lurking in his mind uh, the exact time was unknown to believers. Biblical writers introduce, uh, introduce mention of it with great depth of reverence. For example. In Hebrews 1, 6, when he, the Father, bringeth them the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Uh, should we should we celebrate Jesus' birth? Well, God did. Yeah, amen. He had angels go to the shepherds and announce the birth of the child and to go and find him. And they, they, they got quite a show. I'd love to have heard it mm-hmm. with, the, with the singing and the, the joy. I, I, peace on earth and to all men of good will. I mean, goodness. Should we, should we acknowledge it today? I think so. Yes. If we don't, that's fine. I mean, we don't, we're not required, to, 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 especially on the 25th. We could do it any day of the year, but uh, I think we should do it sometime. And it goes on, and, and it says, uh, Then at the w- command of the Father, suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, Son of peace and goodwill toward men. The angels of God and all that innumerable heavenly hosts of ministering spirits, flames of fire, were poised, ready, and awaiting the Father's word to burst forth into rapturous praises over the birth of the babe designed to uh, destined to rule the nations. What a day. What a moment of beyond compare. The fullness mm. of time had come. And this part here is titled, uh, While the Shepherds Watch Their Flocks at Night. Uh, and, and people say that they didn't do it at that time. Yes, they do. <laughs> And, yes. and, and it, it, they have to be especially careful this time of year because it's cold. There's no place to put them. So they're out in the cold and they're watching them. So it says, years ago in large volumes entitled Picturesque 
Palestine, the much traveled canon uh, uh, H. B. Tristram died in 1906. Made frequent visits to Palestine. Wrote as follows: Volume one, page 124. A little know of all the trees surrounding a group of ruins marks a traditional site of the angel's appearance to the shepherd. Migdol Adair. Migdol Tower. Magdalene. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, lo- the the Tower of the Flock. Isn't that interesting? Very. The Tower of the Flock. This is a place. It says, but the place where the first glory in its excelsis was sung probably further east, where the bare hills of the wilderness began, and a large tract is claimed by Bethlehemites as a common pasturage. Here the sheep would be too far off to be led into town at night and exposed to the attacks of wild beasts from the eastern ravines where the wolf and jackal still prowl and where of old yet more formidable lion and bear had had their covert. They needed the shepherd's watchful care during the winter and spring months when a lone pasturage is to be found on these bleak uplands. Now, see, that's the thing. People say, well, they're not there with their sheep. Well, guess what? Yes, they are. <laughs> they are. And, and, not only that. and it's an... It, huh? Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, it's just another example of how people take the, you know, this, this basic concept of whether or not that time of year would find shepherds uh, watching their flock by night. They they take this uh, idea that someone said, well, surely the she- that, that can't be right because shepherds would not be watching their flocks by night at that time of year. And it gets repeated and repeated and repeated till everyone just takes it as a fact. And even, you know, well-meaning Christians who would still consider uh, Christmas to be an okay thing to celebrate on December 25th, they concede, well, that probably is proof that it wasn't December 25th. So people just take this as a fact when in reality it takes a little bit of time and it takes a little bit of research, but you can prove this to be untrue and that, in fact, it would be consistent with that time of year. Yes, and, and that's the thing. And, and when when people start saying, "Well, it's obvious," so it's like, "Well, no, it's not obvious." I don't. I've never watched sheep. Mm-hmm. I, I've right. seen them, but, but I've never been a person to work with them. It, it's not not part of my experience. But but I I I, I do know that, that there are people that pay attention to these things, mm-hmm. and I, I bought into it too. Where well, they just obviously didn't do it. Well, wrong. They did do. It. Yeah, and and they might not be able to do it there anymore. I don't know. People move in and stuff, but but they they also have a tower, in Migdal uh, in there, the shepherd's tower, the or the flock's tower, that was used to watch flocks. Mm-hmm. That 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 the, 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 there was a, a legend that got associated with it. Now now that. That, that's going a little bit farther than just uh, setting the date in December. You know, this is actually yeah. picking a place and associating that with the event, regardless of when it happened. Right, so, right. so when they when they find that the, that there are certain patterns that the, that the shepherds used to do, and this, this this article was written in the '60s, so you know it, it might not be valid anymore, but but it was at the time of uh, this guy in 1907. The the, the 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 flocks would be taken further further east from there, and and that they would actually have to watch them because they didn't have a choice. If they were a little closer to the town, they'd just take them into the town and it'd be over with. But but some people didn't have that luxury, and they were they were uh, taking their sheep to where there was pasturage. In fact, uh, there, a little later in the article, it, it mentions uh, the, the pasturage patterns. The, the tendency by December was in 1907 to take them further out. Mm-hmm. So, so that means that they were probably further out, and they probably didn't come in. So, it wouldn't be just you know a couple of shepherds. It was probably most of the shepherds ended up going in and looking at the baby. Right. All right. So that's amazing. Yeah, it really is. When you start looking around and actually finding some stuff and, 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 and kind of go, okay, okay, 
we got this here, this here, this here. But but when we go to, to my uh, R.C. Zaner uh, book on Zoroastrianism and, and, and the original Mithras, we don't find anything about December 25th. There's nothing exactly. There. there is nothing there. There is no document anywhere that, that says anything about uh, uh, Mithras and December 25th is being connected in any way. The experts don't even, the, matter of fact, the experts know less now than they thought they did a hundred years ago. Hmm. And, Isn't that something? So who are we going to trust? These documents that go all the way back to antiquity, right around the time mm -hmm. uh, that these traditions were being established, or are we going to believe something that was written in, you know, 1854, (laughs) you know, nearly 2,000 years removed from the actual events, whether it's pertaining to these pagan gods or pertaining to the one true God? Exactly. Exactly. What are we going to believe? Mm-hmm. The, the, one of the things about this, and, and this is this is a big problem. Uh, and, and and you know you, you can you can look at a lot of the histories and you, you'll see exactly what I mean. Uh, but but that whole era of the, of the Enlightenment, okay, as far as uh, it being enlightening, as far as history goes, uh, it was it was pretty good with the newer stuff. Well, when it came down to old history, a lot of that was a lot of that wasn't too well done, and 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 they had a tendency to to kind of fill in the blanks however they wanted to, and and they they would often use pretty bad sources or they'd make it up on their own. So so we had they had this going on, you know, all through the seventeen and eighteen hundreds, and and uh, and and some people got away with it even in the early nineteen hundreds. That's what that's where we're looking at uh, Fraser and uh, and. Uh, um, uh, what's his name? Graves. Uh, there, there's no, there's no reason why we should assume that they are correct because we have found out so much more with uh, with uh, the works in anthropology and archaeology, mm-hmm. uh, history. We we we're actually weeding out some of the the bad history. Uh, you know, I mean, Diodorus Siculus was a very poor historian, and he was even worse with mythology. But but if you go to Barossus, who straightened out a lot of the uh, mess that that uh, that uh, Diodorus made, uh, he 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 is actually fairly reliable. Uh, he had a, had another guy, a Sankiniathan, uh, who who was a uh, uh, the Phoenician, and, and his is fairly reliable, and it seems to jive with the Bible, and and, and it jives really well with it, you know, with what we what what. Uh, what he knew with what we have in the Bible. So we find out Baal is not a sun god. Hmm. Baal is not a sun god. Baal is a, is a storm god. And, it, and if, you, if you trace him back, we can trace him back to Teshup, the, uh, the uh, Mitanni uh, god of storms. It, he's related to the Hittite god of storms. And he and comes directly from Babylon... There's Hadad, Hadad, hmm. and and that's who that's who Baal is, and the L, <laughs> his father, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. was was uh, was the god the, the the key god. He was actually the big god, and Baal, isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. It was was placed as as his representative, and and that's where you get into Doctor Heiser, and he's talking about how Baal rides on the on the clouds and stuff like this, and that the, the, this imagery is borrowed by the Bible to because they, they understand it. Right. There, there's just all these little things like that, and and you know when when we hear. Uh, the Hebrew roots people talking. Uh, there's a guy I, I pay attention to, uh, Stephen. Uh, uh, oh, what's his last name? Um, Stephen A. Uh, oh, just one second. And uh, well, oh, oh, Aramaic. He's an Aramaic uh, scholar. Uh, okay, Mystic. M I S S I C K. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, that's why I keep wanting to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, he uh, he he's he's done some really remarkable work uh, because he he's a he's a Semitic languages scholar, and he went back and he he wrote uh, uh, went back over the uh, actual uh, mythology of the Phoenicians, the Can- Canaanites, because that's who they are. They're Canaanites, the Phoenicians. Mm-hmm. Right? And and their 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 language is so close to Hebrew uh, that it's just unbelievable, and that uh, they the 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 stories of Baal, you know, they have certain parallels, and just like Doctor Heiser points out that uh, that yeah. God that the Lord uses the, this imagery in, in cases because it's already known to them, so that they can see it. And and he, so he has he had actually done the whole mythology up. He had a couple books out. He had one, uh, Baal, God of Thunder, mm-hmm. and uh, that. Uh, uh, and I'd, I'd like to get my hands on it actually because uh, he he actually translated it and filled it in with some blanks, filled, filled some blanks in with what the scholars right now think, uh, you know, constituted the myth and stuff. And, and he actually tells the stories. He also he also tells the Ennead uh, of of, uh, of Egypt, of the the nine gods of Egypt, and uh, their story. And and mm-hmm. he translated it and uh, and worked with it as well because he was working with uh, some stuff about Moses. And and, he, and and by by actually going back to the real mythology, he got he got in trouble with a lot of people that uh, believe Hislop. Uh, uh, and in his doctrine is gospel truth, and they told him he was going to hell wow. for for exposing this, and and so he's he's one of these people that has done some really uh, heavy duty work showing the error of Hislop doctrine because it is a doctrine, and and it basically it goes like this uh, that Nimrod. Um, started accruing power to himself and had become a mighty hunter before the Lord. And because he was able to show his martial uh, prowess, that he gathered an army to himself and took over the whole area and conquered uh, the whole fertile triangle. And that would include Israel and down into Egypt. That's mm-hmm. generally the story, and then his wife Samiramis uh, was a very immoral woman, and that uh, that the two of them together began the uh, pagan worship of many gods and set themselves up as gods and goddesses themselves, and that uh, that uh, meanwhile Shem <laughs> supposedly. Uh, although it's set in the uh, uh, in, in the Egyptian mythology, uh, but Shem uh, rises up and 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 denounces the practice, and is able somehow. Now, I don't know how I'd like to know, <laughs> he was able to uh, pronounce the, him a heretic and execute him. And cut his body up into many pieces and ship it all over the uh, kingdom as a, as a as a um, um, an example, really, of what happens to people who promote this kind of false doctrine. Huh. And somehow, Samiramis lives through this <laughs> <laughs> and is able to reestablish her control over the kingdom. And promote her posthumous son as being the reincarnation of Nimrod. Hmm. This is his doctrine in a nutshell. Right. And and, and it's like, okay, you, I, I was okay with it right up until the part about Shem executing him. Right. I mean, if, if this then, is a real, if this is a real event in history, it loses that ring of realism right there. 
Right. And 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 how I ever ever accepted it, I don't know. Well, you know, it, it it I think what it boils down to is this sense that a lot of people have that they are somehow on to a track of information that is uh, special, mm-hmm. yeah. that sets them apart, that they feel elite because they are in the know, so to speak. And that's a that's a classic trait of a cult, actually. Sure. Um, you know, that they have access to information that, 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 that the normal run-of-the-mill idiots don't can't well, figure uh, out, you uh, know. And... And I think that's what it kind of comes down to. And there's a certain, I mean, you know, we're all human. There's a certain uh, uh, way that I can understand that. You know, it feels good to feel like you figured something out and that that, that you're, you know, you can feel smart and special and, yeah. and elite. But uh, the problem is when the house of cards starts falling down, you either abandon it as someone like Woodrow did. Right. Or you keep kicking your feet and sinking further and further and further into the quicksand, um, you know, making excuses for your bad scholarship, which is just excuse upon excuse upon excuse. And suddenly it, it, it makes less sense than it did when it started. But, right. you know, the, the, the thing that I, I kind of want to get to here also is that, uh, you, you know, you made a really good point in, with regard to um, Baal as the the storm god, oh. and uh, uh, Mike Kaiser's reference to that, and how uh, this imagery was used to uh, sort of trigger that that notion in the people of the time, in referencing it now to uh, God Almighty, right. but. Uh, you can see the same thing happening in the usage of the phrase king of king and lord of lords where um you know the yes that phrase was used for previous kings in antiquity but because it was a phrase that had such uh importance to the people of the time uh it was attached to Jesus Christ right. and uh you know in um in uh in, in in such a way that it was understandable to those people that this was the king of kings and lord above all lords right. it made sense to them because it was a phrase that they had connected to something previously even though it had been previously ascribed to either earthly kings or pagan gods that you know didn't exist and so what i'm driving at with all of this is that you know, one of the primary things that you hear as an objection to celebrating Christmas is that it is the uh, usurpation of pagan imagery, uh, pagan celebration, right. this type of thing, and that that is something that we should never do because yeah. if we do so, then we are, as I said, accidental pagans, right? That right. we, um, in spite of ourselves, have become pagan because we use these words, phrases, traditions, symbols, whatever, right. that might have been used by some pagan in antiquity to represent something entirely different. Uh-huh. So, so I, I guess what I'm, my point is, is that, is it really, like, let's say that the Christmas tree really did start out uh-huh. as something that was worshipped by, you know, pagans at some point. Is it really so bad for us, so far removed from that reality of the time to take this thing and repurpose it for our own purposes. I think I was telling you about how somebody, uh, you know, I was telling you about how my grandfather had used the triangle shape of a Christmas tree Mm -hmm. to explain the Trinity to us. You know, is there any scriptural reason for us to not use things of this nature for the glory of God? Well, well, we go back to Dr. Heiser and his work. I mean, that that mm-hmm. that, that by itself uh, it does show that that the Lord uh, has appropriated for His own purposes 
uh, mm-hmm. certain things that are, that are patently pagan. Right. Uh, not only that, our 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 picture of a uh, of a uh, the uh, the uh, uh, cherubim uh, mm-hmm. is is directly the same as that came out of uh, out of Babylon. Is that, does that mean that the four creatures standing before, before the throne of God are not the ones that are described in the Bible? The thing is, is there is no, to my knowledge, there is no uniquely uh, Christian or even uniquely Jewish symbol anywhere mm-hmm. that is not in one way or another uh, comparable to a symbol from, from, a, uh, from a heathen culture. Uh but does that mean that we don't use symbols? Well, right. that's that's nonsense. Words are symbols. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so the thing is, is that God God does show us, you know, with the uh, with His borrowing the the Baal imagery, with by borrowing the cherubim imagery, uh, and who's to say that that it, that it wasn't stolen from God in the first place? You know. Uh, which right. uh, uh, you know is, is is kind of an open question. You know, if you look at what Brian Godawa talks about, you know, with, with mm-hmm. his work, uh, he doesn't he doesn't go into all of that. But the thing is, is that where do the where do the Nephilim get all that stuff, huh? Right. Uh, what, how how right. do they determine what looks majestic? Well, they had to they had to steal it from God. You know, you, you really mm-hmm. think about it. So, so, so what it really comes right down to, we're just stealing it back. Because before, uh, bef- I, I've said this before, but I, I, I think it bears repeating. Before a single pagan walked the earth and worshipped a tree, God created that tree. Yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> you know, if, 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 if a person who has the intent of worshiping the Lord on a specific day wants to bring a tree into their home as a part of this celebration, then by all means do so if 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 that is a way that you celebrate because mm-hmm. it doesn't make you I, I don't believe in this line of accidental paganism I don't believe in that mm. and I think a lot of it comes from uh, this notion of ascribing human emotions to God Almighty for example there is this uh and 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 I will say that Basil touched upon this in the Canary Cry Radio episode uh-huh. that they did recently on Christmas, and he, and I want to drill down on it because he brings up the idea that uh, one of the lines that's used is, you know, what if you celebrated your wife's birthday on your ex girlfriend's birthday instead of her actual <laughs> birthday? Well, your wife would be pretty ticked off, right? Yeah. So why would you celebrate Jesus's birthday? birthday on a day that isn't his birthday because you're you're gonna make jesus ticked off and right. that to me is so abs- it's, it's absurd it because it's <laughs> it's making it out to sound like jesus is this jealous girlfriend or boyfriend <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. that that it, it, <laughs> it puts this whole concept of uh of of human emotions on you know our creator and he's so above all of that and outside of all of that and i would i would add uh when we talk about the christmas tree that there is just flawed logic out there uh, a lot of people cite jeremiah 10 right. uh, uh uh about uh I'll just quote some of it. Um, Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. Uh, For the custom of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak. They have to be carried for they cannot walk, do not be afraid of them, for they can do no evil, neither is it them to in them to do good. So the this very section right. <laughs> is labeled as idols and the living God, right. and that's from the English Standard Version. It, it, it leads with telling you what this section is about. Right. It's not called Christmas trees and the living God or tree worship. It's literally about carving an idol out of a tree mm-hmm. 
and bowing down to worship it. That's something uh, entirely different. Exactly. And not only that, uh, it, it, going back to that 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 uh, comparison with the the the, the ex girlfriend's birthday. Mm-hmm. Well, when we talk about December twenty fifth, what we find is that there is no ex girlfriend's birthday to be had. Absolutely. And so that that the absurdity of that gets even more magnified than than even the way that we've already put it. Because right. because it isn't just this this and and, and I laugh because the, the 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 picture of Jesus you know being like a teenage idol you know <laughs> being all ticked off you didn't get my birthday right you know kind of thing. it's just right. I I just have this picture and it's like you know something one of those novels that we read when we were like fourteen years old. You know, right. bought them yeah. from a, sc- a scholastic, right? Scholastic publishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, it's funny. Uh, it is funny because oh yeah, it is. It just betray it. What it really betrays to me yeah. is this lack of understanding of the gospel itself and what the gospel means. Right. And I think ultimately that's what is lost in all of this. Uh, you know, you shouldn't celebrate this on this day and you're going to, you know, you're, you're celebrating a, a pagan holiday right. and you're, you know, because ultimately I believe that it is pretty clear that uh, Jesus Christ came to free us from that bondage. Exactly. And, and especially, especially the kind of tyranny that a teenage kid would put us under. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Isn't that so oh, true? You know, they, yeah. these people, they're resurrecting, they're re- with this rhetoric, yeah. they're resurrecting these gods that should have no oh, relevance they're their to own us. Gods. <laughs> they are. They're even more absurd. I'm, I mean, that whole that whole thing with uh, with it, it, it's based on Osiris, but it's an even the Osiris story. Mm-hmm. They, they've distorted that out of out of recognition and and put Shem in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, does... of course, the part that's missing from Nimrod, they they say we're worshiping mm-hmm. in our house. Oh, you know, mm. I was reading something that somebody posted where okay, so the they're very sex obsessed. Oh, these these folks, you know, the the Christmas tree is a phallic symbol, uh, and then they go on to say how the Christmas wreath is the female genitalia. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the bow represents blood and it's, it's, (laughs) and they went so far as to say that the Christmas bulbs represent testicles. I'm like, you know, have you ever put that, has that ever crossed your mind? (laughs) And who's playing with Nimrod's member? I know. I'm not. It's. It's outrageous. We would never have had that but, thought until they put it in there. Precisely. We never would have. Had that so, thought. what spirit is at play that is actually injecting these these terrible, dirty thoughts into something that at one time was so wholesome yep. and so pure and innocent? You know, Cliff. I think about how it wasn't that long ago when there was this whole idea from Christians of trying to preserve Christmas and what it really meant. The whole Jesus is the reason for the season and you're not going to take down our nativities in the town square. Even going back, uh, because he was doing the same thing uh, with with Dickens. Mm -hmm. And and he he was definitely gritty, uh, anti, you know... uh, the establishment, you know, with the way the poor uh-huh. were treated. And, and and they wanted to tell us to reject that tradition? Yeah. I don't think so. Right. It, it it what it boils down to is there was a time when Christians were very concerned about preserving this tradition because of what it meant yeah. to the world. Because it is such an amazing time to witness to people. As I said at the beginning, mm. you know, Christmas was a time when I, as 
a non-believer or as a seeker, I would sit down and I would listen to the words to O Holy Night. And when it tells me to fall on my knees, I would weep. And I thought, where is this coming from? You know, why am I crying? I don't even believe in this junk, you know, but it, it moved my spirit in such a way that, you know, not long after I eventually did choose Jesus, you know, accept Jesus Christ as my savior. And that a large part of that is because of these um, moments that I had previously around the Christmas season where I was for that one time of year open to hearing that story about how Jesus Christ was born and 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 what that means and 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 the miracle of it all and and how it ultimately led to his death and resurrection and what all of that means you know i was open to it and 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 i'll i'll add to that that when we take this idea of witnessing mm-hmm. it is a bad witness when we are coming to the world with this conflict about something as important as the birth of Jesus. And so the world is looking at us now as Christians and saying, gosh, they can't even agree on whether or not they should celebrate his birthday. You know, they can't even agree on whether or not it's a good thing Mm -hmm. to celebrate something that they used to proclaim to be such an important day. You know, so it's actually breaking down it's breaking well, down our witness, if that makes well, sense. Well, not only that, it's also uh, it's also a, a lot of contention within the brotherhood. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we are we are supposed to be brothers and sisters, and right. instead of, we are we're looking more and more like Cain and Abel, mm-hmm. and that uh, that's not good. And in in of course they're, they're like, well, it's your fault. We're like, okay, <laughs> let's back up. Who's who's doing the accusing? Right. That's really where it comes down to. Who's doing the accusing? Well, we know who's doing the accusing. They are, mm-hmm. and and it's, it's because they're trying to trying to assert themselves as some kind of an authority of the law. Right. This this is exactly what Paul was saying about them. That's why they're they're the children of of the slave, or the children mm-hmm. of the free. The, the the thing is, is that. We don't have to be ashamed of it very much. What we what we have to do is we have to say, "Hey, look, commercialism really wasn't our idea. It wasn't. Yeah. We we're not all about money. Now, the people that are okay, they make a profit on it. Who's making a profit off of off of the those greeds saying that Christmas is all evil? Right. Oh, oh, Maria Marola." <laughs> oh, Miss Blackbird, Madame Blackbird, she, she gears up for this time of year. So it's Michael oh. Rude. These people are these people are just as commercialistic, and they're out for their profit. And as long as it stays around, they're going to have their fans because they're people that don't like that. Yeah. And and the fact is, is we don't have to like the commercialism. We don't have to like what the world does. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've lived in two different countries uh, through Christmas time, and and I've been in China, and and they have Santa Claus uh, images around all year round. You'll mm-hmm. hear Christmas music all year round. The government likes the people going out and buy, 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 buying. Right. They like that. But I'll tell you what, the Christians there use it as, as a way of talking to people and saying, this is what I believe. Mm. And Christianity is growing exponentially there. It, it's scary how fast it's growing over there. And, and when I was in Turkey, the, the Muslims are a little concerned about that. <laughs> yeah. And over, the, over in Turkey, you know, they have Christmas too. The Turks, the people themselves, the, the, there's a lot of... Uh, Crypto Christianity there. That right. that they they there were converted people that hid it, hid their faith, and and that that happened all through their history. And there's there's still Armenians that are coming out and saying, "Hey, I'm really Christian." 
but they, they supposedly you can never convert away from Islam, and the government uh, keeps them on record as Muslims. And there's people that uh, I, I would go to church, and I would go to church with Turks and Iranians and Pakistanis and people from many Muslim countries that are no longer Muslim. And the government there also promotes buy, 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 buy. Oh, they like the money getting passed around, but they don't. They don't want to have the stuff about Jesus. No, don't don't be talking about no Jesus. Right. Well, guess what? The people whisper. Mm. So, so when when I hear these folks saying that we should we should just quit talking about it, and we're all wrong for talking about it and supporting it, I have to say that they're dead wrong. Amen. You know, it makes me think about how some people say, is uh, Christians say, and you know, maybe we've all been guilty of this, but you know, we say things almost disdainfully about the people who only show up for church on Christmas and right. Easter. And, you know, as, as though it's this terrible thing. And, you know, I've come to think that it's a beautiful thing because that means that there are still days where you can get a non-believer into a church to hear about Jesus sure. Christ. That in and of itself makes Christmas special. There is something about that day that can pull people into a church that have never had any desire to be there. Yeah. And to me, that's remarkable. That means that there is still this power to the, this, this powerful moment to witness yeah. that we should not be shutting down because maybe somebody claims that somebody else was had a birthday right. on that day well, well like i say the, the 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 boyfriend or girlfriend that they, they're they're trying to make it out like you're celebrating their that birthday mm -hmm. in place of isn't there right and, and there's just no it, evidence no there is none there is absolutely none at all and, and, and the mistress experts will tell you, the, the ones that are mm -hmm. honest, will say, we have no proof. Do some of them believe it is? And some of them believe that they'll find the proof. I don't know why they have to think that it has to be that day. So, so, you see, that's the thing. That day, the, the solstice, is the shortest mm -hmm. day of the year. Okay? Right. That, that night theoretically, should symbolize the death of the sun. Mm -hmm. The next day, after the solstice, should be celebrated as actually the birth of the sun. Right. That's, that's just using the basic logic that goes into why people say that that is the, 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 why the solstice is the, the, the day it is, and that, why that, that mm -hmm. should be the celebration of the sun's birth. No, no, no. The sun and its culmination, possibly. Or when you mm -hmm. celebrate the day that the light is starting to gain again. And, 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 and of course, you know, the last day of it shortening, that's... I don't see how, how, how you can actually say that that's the birthday of the sun. It almost right. should be the 26th. But, but at any rate, uh, the thing is, is that the Romans didn't find any significance with the solstice. They just didn't, and the the, the significance with the uh, with the uh, equinoxes actually goes to the seasons and and, and how the seasons uh, originally were viewed as a year, and that's why December is the tenth of the uh, tenth month, right? Right. Is it's the tenth month from uh, from May? Mm -hmm. So so why did they change that? Well, they went to the Julian calendar, and that goes with Caesar. And so that uh, that that's where that came from. Now, now uh, something that uh, some people want to make a big deal about is how the uh, the uh, the the Orthodox Church sees January sixth as the uh, actual birthday of Christ. Right. The, Epiphany. Well, the reason why that 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 is so is because when they made the adjustments to the calendar, uh, I don't remember what year it was. Uh, it was 1300 sometime, I think. 13 or 1400. 
But uh, when they made that adjustment to the calendar, that that the solstice was moved to the twenty second, and and so your horoscopes, you know, with the the, uh, uh, the uh, ones that are done according to the uh, uh, Ptolemaic method, right? The mm-hmm. uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 horoscope starts with uh, Aries. Uh, and and uh, you know the, the procession of the ages, all that kind of stuff. That uh, that all uh, goes along with that, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. and, but but that's also why the sixth is twenty fifth. See, the twenty fifth, if it never moved, would have been would have been January sixth. Right. And so that's that's the way, that's the way the adjustment was made. Well, I think it's a good point because you know there is evidence to suggest that various uh, places throughout the world mm-hmm. in antiquity have used different days to celebrate the birth of Jesus, right. and uh, the, you know the cho- the choice of December twenty fifth is not entirely arbitrary. I mean, no. as we discussed, there are there are reasons why that date was chosen, but ultimately. That is the day that culturally and worldwide now is has this significance, and we're never going to change that. We're oh. never going to, as a Christian consensus, say let's change it to sometime in September, and then everybody goes along with it. That's not going to happen. December twenty fifth is the day that is recognized for the celebration of Christmas, and therefore, you know, we have to decide: do we Put that aside, or do we take that opportunity to set aside this time of special uh, worship and reverence for the recognition of the birth of Jesus? Because as I say, you know, if, if he wasn't born, he would not have lived. And if he hadn't lived, he couldn't die. And if he di- if he didn't die, he couldn't rise again. So it is a significant thing to celebrate. And as you mentioned, the angels celebrated. God Almighty wanted this birth to be heralded. And so there is nothing, nothing whatsoever that I can find that should convince us that celebrating the birth of Christ is a bad thing. Yeah. And it will forever Christmas, no matter how commercialized the world makes it, you know, the United States has made it into this commercialized holiday, as you mentioned, in China and Turkey and everywhere else, there is this commercialization, there's this materialization of the day, but you'll never be able to separate the reason why it is called Christ mass there's there is that significance that will be forever attached to it and what we as christians need to decide is if we are going to take that fact and use it as this uniquely positioned day of the year to talk to our fellow man about the birth of christ or are we going to join the world and say that this is a completely insignificant day mm-hmm. yeah well that's the thing i if we're going to try to uproot this by by the back of its neck and stuff, uh, it, it's not going to produce anything good. Right. Uh, the, the the believers believers around the world uh, deal with what they have, and and you know we, they don't they don't have quite the commercialism we have here. But but I'll tell you what, China is really pushing it hard, and so is Turkey. And mm-hmm. and they uh, they have no interest whatsoever in promoting Christianity, right. uh, but the Christians there do take advantage of it, and uh, yeah, sure. yeah, well they should too, uh, and uh, that's that that's really a lot of the thing. There there's no reason why we shouldn't uh, go ahead and celebrate. And as far as it goes, I I I do find it interesting that we can defend. The twenty fifth as a as a legitimate day. There is there are reasons why people pick that time, and mm-hmm. and it and it goes back. You know, you mentioned the Epiphany, uh, the, the birth of John the Baptist. You know, all these things. The the, the, the interplay of those things led some people at an early time. Uh, what it was it one thirty um, A.D. Mm-hmm. when they started saying December twenty fifth. So no matter how you cut the, cut the cake, there was no there was no real celebration of anything else on that day. Yeah. 
Yeah. When they when they established it, it was a free day. They didn't pick Saul Invictus until until two seventy four. That's that's a long time later. Mm-hmm. And for for people to to uh, put a black mark on that day arbitrarily, uh, it is just utter foolishness. Uh, yeah. And not only that, uh, there, there, there's even if there was a day there. It is. It is not wrong for God to 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 use that, you know, to take it and appropriate it for for the, whatever good we can put out of it, right? Mm-hmm. That, that that's the thing. It, it, it's not illegitimate. When when God was talking about writing a, 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 a writing on the uh, the, the clouds, uh, uh, th- that that's a good example with because that's an image of Baal. Mm-hmm. Uh, good grief! I mean, if that's if that's fine, then why not this? Absolutely. I mean, what better example could be provided for taking something that is understandable to the culture, the culture in which we live? understands Christmas. They may not understand it the same way that a devout Christian would, but it is something that is in the cultural mind. Everybody celebrates it in some way. So to take that example of Baal or to take that example of, of uh, you know, King of King, Lord of Lords, to take these examples of how things that were culturally significant and flipping them to point to the savior or to point to the God almighty. That is what we can and should do. And we have the freedom in Christ to do so. And it only, only good things can come of that. Um, I, I would just, I add, I, I guess we're, we're coming close to the end here, but I would add that by no means are, Am I, and I, I'm sure that it's the same for you, by no means am I telling people that they have to celebrate no. Christmas. If you're convicted not to, then don't. And it, there's nothing biblically that commands you to celebrate no. Christmas no. either. It, you know, it does boil down to what is in your heart and what you ha- have decided to do with your family and with your uh, worship. Sure. But just as I am saying that I do not think that people have to celebrate Christmas, I would ask the same of people who don't celebrate it, don't tell me I can't or that I it is impossible to worship in spirit and truth on that day. Don't tell me that either. I don't see why we should pick one day to say we can't celebrate uh, God, the Lord in any way mm-hmm. we decide we want to. Right. That we worship Him in spirit and truth. That, that we can do that any time. Mm-hmm. The, 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 I think that they're giving the devil far too much credit here. Amen. And that the, he doesn't have a day. And we can even take things like Halloween and show show why we shouldn't give up on those. Mm-hmm. There, there's no day that we should just sit there and say. This is this is fuller of the devil, right? It's not. There is no right. day that is, is that is his. Uh, all 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 the earth is the Lord's. Well, every time Absolutely. this is also. Right. I, I right. think I think that the, the devils of hell have really been having a lot of fun with these things, and and they're 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 manipulating stuff to 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 a point. I I don't know quite where it's going. But but uh, there there's a you know that's smearing a lot of good. Well, and it's truly benefiting the world when we are dismantling all of these things, all of these ways in which Christians have classically expressed themselves and worshipped and witnessed when we are systematically trying to dismantle all of it and saying Christians shouldn't do this and Christians shouldn't do that. It seems to me that the end game is almost 
that we're doing the work for the world by pushing Christians underground, but it's coming from the inside, not from right. what, what, what you would expect. You know, it's, it's saying we should isolate. We should, well, you know, we should, uh, you know, remove ourselves from any visibility because any amount of visibility can somehow be misconstrued as participating in something pagan. Well, so where does that leave us, and where does that leave the Great Commission? Well, yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, the, thing, the thing there, though, it goes back to what is the world structure. Uh, the way I've always understood it is this. Uh, the world seeks justice. Mm -hmm. That is why it, it likes the law so much. Right. And that is why legalism is the way of the world. And that when it really gets right down to it, the people that really want to enforce the law don't want the law enforced on them. Yeah. So what happens is that they become very lawless. See, we get accused of being lawless. We're antinomian, you know, because mm -hmm. we, we don't want to be under the law. Well, we, we're not under the law. We, we've our relationship to the law has changed. Right. But the world doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and so, you know, they, what they want us to have happen to us is that we're grilled for every sin that we committed. And mm -hmm. that there is no escape from that. Well, that's, see, that's where the world's wrong. There is an escape from it. And our relationship to the law has changed because now we're not looking at the law as coming down and smacking us. But we, because you know, we, 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 we obey in, in spirit and truth, we might make mistakes, but, but we aren't going to be penalized by God for certain things that we did do. I think, I think that's an amazing point, and I think that's a really good, good place for us to sum up because yeah. ultimately... The the Accus accusers against, against people who do celebrate things like Christmas are doing are doing the same the thing same thing as our Christmas. ultimate accuser, sure. which which is to, to oh now oh now I'm getting, getting this echo again, but but ultimately it's it's trying, it's trying to, to take away grace. grace. Yeah. It's Trying it's trying to put us back under bondage. It's trying, it's trying to, put to put us in, the in this place where, where our, savior our Savior and the promise, and the promise of, that of that is not enough. Right. And then that's exactly it. If that's right on the head. They're trying to put us back under that. They're trying to put us back mm -hmm. under the law to where we, we have to obey every jot and tittle of the law and, and to mark off the little checklist that they have out. And and they, they want to do that to us. They want to tell us every little thing we've done wrong and say, you have to pay for this. Yep. Yep. And, and see, that is the way of the world. The world, the world identifies with that because they want, they want justice. Well, you, you know, you, when, you, when you look at the way that Christ talks about that, justice and mercy... I think mercy is a little better, uh, but 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 I think the the, the best example is the, where he gives the example of a of a, a, a man that had uh, done 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 wrong to to his master, and his master forgives him of the of what he had done and and doesn't and doesn't send him to prison, and lets the man go, and that man goes to somebody else who owes him money. And picks him up by the throat. It's like, you must pay me. And he's like, I can't pay you. Can you please give me some time? He's like, no. And he throws him in prison. And, and the, the, the Lord is like the, the, the Lord in this picture here who finds out about this and says, how dare you do that to somebody that owed you less? I forgave you much more than you, than you, pen, than, than, than the, you penalized him over. How dare you do that? That is exactly what it is. And 
we we have to examine it from that perspective. See, that this is why their their view of God as being angry to begin with is 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 wrong. Mm-hmm. Is God angry? Yeah, he gets angry. You don't want to be there if he is. That's fact. But he's not, he's, they make it sound like he's some kind of a, a, a god of some little island, you know, and everybody's like, you know, Turu si Bagumba, you know, and they throw the virgin in, you know, <laughs> you know, like right. off Gilligan's right. Island, right? And, and that's the kind of, kind of nonsense that I think of when I hear them talk. And it's like, are we talking about the same god? Right, right. Uh, you know, I've, I've never heard it quite that way, but, you know, they're all th- saying that, you know, <laughs> I, you know, they're, they're all saying that that's how we should be all the time. It's like, are you out of your mind? We're the children of God. You know, there, there, there's a point where we we should stand up, right, and, mm-hmm. and 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 be thankful for one thing, and 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 and, and tell them, hey, <laughs> who are you to tell me? <laughs> You know, I, and, yeah. and, and and we're the ones we're the ones that are judgmental. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of that. Me of that, um, that um, when you were talking, I just thought of that that, 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 that stupid Jim Carrey movie, Mighty. Bruce yeah. Almighty, when, he, when he's he, mad at God and he's yeah. yelling at God and he's oh, saying, mighty, "Oh, smite me, Almighty Smiter!" Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> it that, seems that that is the picture of God that people have, and it's so incorrect. And it's so incorrect. Yeah, and 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 it, 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 and of course the world laughs at that too, mm-hmm. but but they mm-hmm. but they but we we're all looking for justice, you know, and then that's the thing. Right. And this is a world of justice, but we should be looking for the world of grace, mercy. That that's that's where that's where we're coming in. We're you know the the people with the angry God over there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to do with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, does my God get angry? Oh, you betcha. But, but and who he gets angry at is those that persecute us. And, yeah. Right. Amen. 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 Well, well, Cliff, Cliff, this connection is getting really bad. Yeah. So I think that might be um, our cue. Okay. <laughs> to 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 wrap up here but before oh now now the echo went away anyway before we close out i want you to tell us a little bit because we didn't talk about this at the beginning but i want you to tell us about like flint radio because i know that's a big thing that you're a part of and for the people in the audience who have never heard of it um i love what you guys do over there because there's so much uh focus on history and philosophy and theology uh tell tell me about that show well uh I I was doing a uh, a program uh, of my own uh, over here in the U.S. Uh, before I went overseas, and then when I got overseas, I revived it as a kind of a, a, a Facebook page, uh, mm-hmm. American Amnesia. I I did mostly uh, a political and social commentary, uh, but uh, but my my viewpoint as a Christian has always been part of it, and. Uh, and, and I, I also got into some kind of things like you know Fortiana. I, I, I've, I've always been kind of fascinated with uh, strange sure. phenomenon and uh, just all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and but I did I did uh, some things that were also kind of uh, public service stuff. Uh, I, I did uh, I did one episode on uh, well actually two on uh, uh, the. Um, the the uh, uh, title loans and and how that those are uh, just exorbitant amounts of money that they get out of p- poor people, and uh, so that uh, that that was what I was doing. And uh, when I was in Turkey, I was mostly posting politics, but I was posting some other stuff too, like I say, and and it was kind of in the same spirit as as before, uh, and. Uh, and uh, my my cohorts uh, at uh, like Flint Radio come from uh, Future Quake uh, Southern Hemisphere, and uh, wonderful folks, uh, and, and 
I I was a guest uh, quite often on their program, and uh, and uh, I, I was mostly interviewed about uh, historical things and stuff. So mm -hmm. that that's um, that's where I came in, and uh, and we all had a had an interest in um, promoting uh, the gospel in some way, shape, or form, and. Uh, so uh, what what uh, Garth does is he has his flake, his little chip off, right? Mm -hmm. Is uh, mm -hmm. is is uh, uh, teaching people how to interpret Greek uh, from the in the Bible. Uh, he uh, he's done a lot of work with uh, with the translation and stuff, and he's pretty good with it. Uh, it it's it's uh, he's a good person to ask on that because he's learned quite a bit. It, and he he does a uh, does his program on that, and then uh, then we have uh, Andy Andy Tide, and she uh, she's doing uh, right now. She's uh, reading from uh, Eusebius's uh, Church History, and uh, and doing a little analysis with that. It's pretty cool, and uh, and then uh, uh, Cruzy he's doing a, a kind of a. a uh, analysis of certain preachers and stuff, and uh, mm -hmm. and basically uh, looking at uh, where uh, bad doctrine comes in and showing you how it works and how this teacher might be skewing things a little bit. He he does a very fine job of that. And uh, mine, I do one. Uh, it, it's kind of a. <laughs> Uh, open season, really, but uh, it's called uh, "What Are You Reading This Week?" And, and generally, uh, it, it's uh, it's a book or, so, or something that I've been studying recently, and uh, and we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, and, and generally speaking, uh, it'll be history and stuff. Uh, although my favorite uh, from from uh, from uh, the uh, like Flint program uh, really has to be uh, uh, Umberto Eco's. Uh, 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 the, the Prague Cemetery, and and that that's actually a work of fiction, but it it really does show uh, how some people had uh, put together over time, put together the uh, protocols of the uh, learned elders of Zion. Uh, that uh, the 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 way he describes it actually is pretty feasible. And it's it's really interesting. It's a great book. Um, I, I recommend it very highly. It really, I recommend anything by uh, Echo. Uh, pretty much, he's uh, he teaches uh, semiotics just by writing, mm -hmm. and you can see a lot about how they really were. You you have you have uh, my my computer's talking now, uh, but you have uh, people like Dan Brown who uh, his character supposedly is modeled on Echo, and Echo's not very flattered by that. Uh, that that uh, what's his name, uh, Doctor? Do you remember? The, the name of the character Tom Hanks does. Oh, uh, Lang Langdon. Langdon. Yeah, Doctor yeah. Langdon, and Doctor Langdon's kind of a uh, kind of wooden. You know, he he really he's more of an idea, I guess, than he is a person. And uh, Echo is is much more much funnier. Mm -hmm. uh, much more vibrant, uh, uh, much more curious, uh, yeah. and he's also much more philosophical. And he's uh, he's really a harsh critic. I mean, he he really is. When when he first lambasted uh, Brown uh, for uh, basically stealing Holy Blood, Holy Grail and sticking it into a book. He said it was a bad idea in the first place. Uh, so he, he wasn't too fond of it. And then he, he kind of loosened up a little bit. It's like, well, okay, it's a little flattering, but I still don't really like the books. It's, are they good books? Well, they, they read fast. 
They yeah. do read fast. Really, they do. I, I think I read, back in the day, I think I read The Da Vinci Code in one day. <laughs> yeah, I think I wasn't too far behind you. And, yeah. and, and, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, they're page turners. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and when you finish the book, you don't have anything to really ponder upon. You, there wasn't really much character development. Uh, the plot was contrived you know i mean mm-hmm. it's it, so you know it, it, it's like was it okay yeah it was okay uh do i believe it no uh right. did it do anything for me no not really it, it killed a, it killed a day of reading uh i didn't really learn anything well because that book it just it, it, all those books they just spoon feed you yeah. you know it's like there's no come to your own conclusions. There's no philosophy. There's just here's what I want you to believe, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And it, it, when when you compare it to Echo, for example, if someone wants to read something that's full of mystery and intrigue and whatever, I say pick up the name of the rose. Oh, that's a fantastic story. <laughs> You know, one of my favorites, and that is you want high intrigue and mystery and conspiracy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's the book to pick up. Really, I, I, my favorite's uh, Foucault's uh, Pendulum. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and that, that's just insane. It, he's yeah. lampooning Dan Brown before Dan Brown picked up a pen. <laughs> so and, and which is why I love it so much. But 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 the uh, but the Prong Cemetery is is. Uh, uh, it, it, it has those wonderful Jacobson layers, you know, the Jacobson uh, being the uh, the uh, semiotics uh, expert that he was, uh, and and it shows how uh, that you build on ideas that uh, they, they start from the initial association. And then you kind of make con- additional, con- you know, connections, and you can pull out connections and take them out, and put in new ones. Uh, right. and, and one of the things about that book, he keeps repeating, nothing is new. Yeah, yeah. Everything was written before. That that's why it works. So when you look at conspiracy theories. Brush away the the layers and start digging around to see if there's anything in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's why that's why I keep saying a, a little bit of skepticism goes a long way. Yeah. And uh, that that this is a just absolutely vital part of our discernment, and and mm-hmm. we should never give that up. Yeah, and I think that applies very much to our discussion that we just had. Yes, is does. that, you know, I certainly I c- confess my guilt for taking these accusations about pagan origins, etc. And and I don't know if it was a combination of peer pressure or what it mm-hmm. was, but I took it at face value and it sounded good and I believed it. And Uh, it wasn't until I, you know, started to think, you know, what started me down the the trail of, of rejecting it was that it, I don't know if this is going to come across right, but it didn't feel right. It troubled my spirit. You know, if, if I was, if I was sitting in my home singing, you know, Christmas hymns and pondering the birth of Christ, that felt good and right in my spirit. It felt like that was something pure. But when I was lambasting the concept of Christmas, that troubled my spirit. So that was my starting point. Why is this making me feel icky? (laughs) You know, and then from that point, I thought, well, maybe there's something to it. And you start researching and you start finding uh, where this rabbit trail started and you start recognizing the t- atrocious scholarship involved, you realize I not only bought into assumptions, I not only bought into conjecture, but in most cases I bought into outright lies. Oh, yeah, yeah. It wasn't in the book, of uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Right. <laughs> yeah. It really wasn't. Uh <laughs> Now, now we we can find things that were. 
Uh-huh. Uh, I, I've got my copy of uh, Wallace Budge's uh, Egypt, the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead in my room somewhere. Mm-hmm. So we could we could look that up if we really want to. Right. Uh, it, you know, it, it, but it, it's not it's not. Hislop doesn't talk about. It. Right. He, he 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 isn't even going there. And if he does, uh, I don't think he does. But if, if he does, he, he's only going there to pick up a little smidgen to, to tack on to something else. Mm-hmm. He's he's his 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 scholarship is that bad. I mean, it just <laughs> right. It's uh, it's unbelievable. It's, <laughs> it's so many different pieces, so many moving parts that you have to try to keep track of. You can't possibly keep track of all of them. Nah. So you just kind of say, "Well, this must be right because this guy put you know he's got a lot of footnotes." Right. Right. <laughs> well, but like I say, I've got my R.C. Zaner book, and 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 I and uh, and I, I knew Samira Sir Sir was when she was, and I was mm-hmm. still still swallowing it. You know, I mean, I, I was able yeah. to hold that that lie as a truth in my own mind. And mm-hmm. but the fact is, is there is no date of a uh, of a uh, December twenty fifth for anything to do with with uh, Mister Mithras. And mm-hmm. uh, really, uh, even even Mithras as a sun god is kind of dubious. Yeah. Uh, Mitra, the uh, the uh, in Indian, uh, the Hindu god uh, Mitra is a sun god. A sun. Notice the word a sun god, because yeah. they have several in in India. It, but in in uh, it, when when you look at the, the Zoroastrian religion, it's really dubious where Mithra Mithra fits. Yeah, and Ahura Mazda or Maz, the the good god, is clothed with the sun and the stars and the moon and all the lights of the heavens. Mm-hmm. And Mithras is clothed with the sun, showing that he's a he's a he's a minor god in comparison. See, see, that's the thing. Zoroastrian was almost monotheism, mm-hmm. and Mithras really loses his place. He's a god yeah. of contracts. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. And the interesting thing um, is that a lot of scholars now who really look into the cult of Mithras. They recognize that most of what we quote unquote know about that is some is stuff that cropped up post Jesus. In other words, those who proclaim that all of these things about Jesus were based on Mithras. The reality is that he came about or though the right. cult that worshiped him and, and the things that they ascribed to Mithra it, it had an eerie similarity to Jesus, not because Jesus was based on him, but because he was based on Jesus. Exactly. It, the, and it, it's amazing. They don't know where it came from. See, yeah, that's right. the thing. And, and not only that, if, if you, if you look at what we do know about, about the Mithra, the Mithras mysteries, Mm-hmm. It really has a lot of the ooga booga from the the, the masons in it. Yeah, it and, does. and it's just downright goofy. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the levels is the Persian. Now, why would a Roman want to be a Persian? <laughs> no, I'm serious. And, and, you know, it's so basic. A little higher, it's a father, and the highest level. And and, and if this is a solar god. This is a good question. If this is a solar god, why is the highest level actually Saturnian? Mm. Saturn is the uh, god that supposedly is over that one. Why, why is that? And, and you know, I, I I understand some you know the the astrological stuff here, uh, but but I'm, I'm seeing something there that uh, really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
uh, Saturn uh, is opposite and balances off of uh, off of the sun in in, in the old astro- astrology. Okay, then I get. But there's no reason why a solar concept, you know, that has anything to do with all the solar ideas, you know, of self and brightness and enlightenment and all the things that that implies, I don't see how Saturn would be the crowning point. I I, I don't see it. It it strikes me as kind of opposite. And and, and that, uh, that just doesn't make much sense. No, and I think that I think what we've demonstrated here is that there is no clear cut connection of any of this mm. to the date of December twenty fifth. There's no clear cut connection of any of this to Jesus Christ, his birth, mm. the the celebration thereof, and therefore it is wrong headed of anyone to proclaim this stuff as proof positive of why we should not participate in the celebration of Christmas. You know, I I think in this past conversation that we've had tonight, we've demonstrated numerous reasons why there is at minimum a giant question mark (laughs) hanging over it. So why, yeah. So why is, why is it okay to take these things, present them as fact, and use them as weapons to bludgeon Christians who have the audacity to, uh, you know, to proclaim the miracle of his birth on this day? It doesn't add up, and I think the ultimate point, as you stated, and as I fully agree, is that there really seems to be a spiritual problem here and it really seems to be an attack directly from the enemy and that is probably why those of people like me had that you know I can only describe it as an icky feeling yeah. when I was involved yeah. in it and and it might actually go even further to explain why the people who promote such things do have such a, an aggressive nature to them because it's not coming from a place mm. of wisdom and peace and grace. Right. And, and, and the, the, the slander uh, of, of labeling, really labeling Jesus as Nimrod, I, I just, I just mm-hmm. find unconscionable. Uh, yeah. and, and, and matter of fact, they might even be slandering Nimrod, for all we know. Uh, yeah. We what we have in the Bible, okay. We we it's fair game to speculate all you want with uh, the extra biblical books, you know, jubilees and all that. Uh, although you know we should be very careful with uh, with uh, well, which one was that? Uh, is, um, uh, Joshua, uh, because yeah. that one that one is probably. Actually, a uh, really just completely false. Uh, but but the thing is, is that it's fine. You know, go ahead, speculate all you like. You know, it, 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 as long as it's not made into a doctrine, especially one where you're starting to send people to hell, it's okay. Mm-hmm. But but what we know about Nimrod, and and we can say for sure about him, is very small. And, and and even what's in the Bible doesn't say he himself is evil. Mm-hmm. He's only mentioned three times exactly. in the entirety of the Bible, and and he's not really defined very well. There are some indications that he may have had something to do with what happened at uh, the uh, Tower of Babel, and if so, mm-hmm. then he was trespassing in some some way, shape, or form, or at least we we can pretty well imagine so. There's some people that have, uh, over the years, had different interpretations of all of this. And that that's something we should probably keep in mind. That mm-hmm. uh, what we know about Nimrod is tempered by what we can prove. Mm-hmm. And that uh, any speculation regarding him has to be uh, within certain bounds of what we can, we, we can actually point to in the Bible and... As far as it goes, yeah, it's fine to say that Nimrod was a bad guy because we, we've read the we've, we've read the Book of Jubilees, 
you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But but at the same time, we we still have to temper that. And 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 to and to call Jesus Nimrod, I, I think is just I I can't even I can't even put put words to that. There mm-hmm. there there is no. There's no proof that Nimrod was born on the 25th. There's no proof that Nimrod was Osiris. There is no proof that Nimrod was anybody. We don't know who he was in Sumeria. It, it's, it's a very, very, very thin amount of sunlight that comes through the difference between using Hislop's research to debunk Christmas and using Hislop's research to debunk Christ. Exactly. They are they are so close together that it is just a millimeter away from taking that next step. And that is where it's particularly dangerous because when you're confronting an atheist and you're saying you know, and, and they're saying to you, why are you celebrating Christmas? Because it's got this connection to Nimrod and it's got this, that, and the other thing. And you've got people saying, yeah, you know, Christians saying, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you're kind of right about that. So then they've got you. So then they say, okay, well, if you agree with all of that, then what about this? And the next thing you know, you're trying to debunk Jesus. It's so close. It comes from the same World, it comes from the same realm, and it comes from the same spirit. I truly believe that, and so I think where we can kind of close today's show is just in saying that no one's forcing you to celebrate Christmas. The Bible doesn't command you to celebrate Christmas, but the Bible also doesn't forbid. And in fact, you know, the angels in heaven rejoiced at the birth of Jesus Christ. And in the absence of any specific proof as to the specific day that Jesus Christ was born, I think it is safe to say that the day that we have set aside to celebrate it is December 25th. And that is a wonderful beautiful gift to the world that we as Christians have the opportunity to witness to everyone rather than to squash Mm -hmm. any mention thereof. Because if not on Christmas, then when? Good. You know, it, when when are we going to do it? Because this is a day, as I said, where you're getting butts in the pews or in the church. It's happening. Lord only knows why, but it can't be a bad thing. It cannot be a bad thing that for whatever reason, people respond to that day and they show up. So let's use it. Let's not squash it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and if you want to be a grump, go hide. Yeah, just go hide, and we will we will be singing Christmas carols, and we will be telling uh, the world about the miraculous birth of our Savior. And so, whatever whatever floats your boat, I guess. Have you ever gone caroling? I, you know, I did. I did. I, um, I used to sing a lot more, and it was one of the most wonderful things yeah. oh, to go well. out and just. Spread that joy. And people never, well, I shouldn't say never, but people rarely respond badly to it. Yeah. Every once in a while you end up on Ebenezer Scrooge's doorstep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, that's what, that's really what, what I was kind of thinking of, is, is the people that don't come to the door, they're, they're hiding. It's like, well, they go away. <laughs> <laughs> and we would just sing louder. <laughs> We'll be like, well, we're we're finishing our Christmas Carol. You don't have to come out. That's right. We're 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 doing it, and then you then you move on to the next one because it's like, eh, hey, waste our time here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. It, it's just spreading joy, spreading love and peace. And you know, I know that there's a lot of people out there who will say, well, you know, that's not always a good thing. There are people in other religions or in the New Age or whatever who are all about peace and love, mm-hmm. but there's a difference. There's a difference that comes from the peace of Christ. And there's a difference that comes from, you know, ultimately, I don't have any way to defend Christians cowering in fear of everything. You know, sometimes there are some Christians who are so fearful. Uh, they're, They're afraid they're going to make God mad. They're afraid they're going to make their fellow Christians mad. They're afraid that they're going to do or say the wrong things. And I just don't see that spirit in the gospel. That's not. Perfect love chases out fear. Amen. 
Well, Cliff, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And I think that we've given people hopefully a lot of food for thought. And I'm going to ask you to send me um, a, a list of maybe links that people can use for further research. Okay. Maybe yep. some of the maybe some of the books you've quoted. Uh, you know, some of the the uh, you, you mentioned you had that calendar, uh, and I'll put it all in the show notes. There's one other so thing people, uh, I want to mention mm-hmm. uh, that, that I'll, I'll try to find a, a link to send you that that'll give you this link for this. Uh, but the, the, there's yeah. a fellow named Essie Hemans. Uh, that mm-hmm. he uh, he's a he's a uh, one of the top scholars of a uh, of a uh, like the uh, late antiquity early early uh, medieval time and you know with Constantine and all that and mm-hmm. and he he wrote a, a, a his uh, a dissertation on on Aurelian Constantine and Saul in late antiquity and he mm-hmm. is particularly the person who has. Uh, uh, really um, revolutionized the scholarship in, in modern times on, on all of mm-hmm. this, and and his name is S. E. Hemans, and I and, and I sh- I'll try to get you the the that because it it's uh, for people who want to examine it. There's about uh, about forty pages that, that he really gets into uh, the Christmas uh, and and what. Uh, you know, Aurelian had uh, done with uh, that that calendar, it, what Constantine's role, if any, was, uh, what you know, what connection to Saul, uh, uh, Saul uh, 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 Invictus, there, there is, and and he comes to the conclusion there is none, none. Mm. Constantine had nothing to do with it. Saul Invictus had nothing to do with it. And neither did Aurelian. He comes to the opposite uh, uh, perspective, and 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 this is, this is really where the scholarship has gone. They they they've realized that uh, that there's not a leg to stand on with this historically. And, well, and I'll send that to you. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it in the show notes because I, one thing I really just want to encourage people who are listening, and I know there's a lot of people listening who, you know, there's a lot of information that we're putting out there and, you know, I'm not going to tell you to go and Google it. (laughs) I'm going to tell you to take some of these legitimate sources from people who are real scholars and, and, and take a look at what is written from sources outside of this realm. I'm going to challenge people to do that, even if you're still dead set on believing that everything that you've been told about uh, these, these pagan celebrations and that type of thing. I'm just going to challenge you before you come at me and before you come at Cliff and tell us how heretical we are. Just take a look at the sources research the things that we have spoken of and and just let it marinate and and you know there's nothing wrong there's nothing bad about changing your mind i think that's the danger the the worst thing about the this whole you know crew that follows hislop and others like him is that they invest so much time and energy into defending it that it's so hard to pull yourself out of it because it requires a lot of humility to say, I believed a lie. Mm-hmm. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to be embarrassed about that because I was right there too. I and I too. am just openly admitting it. <laughs> you know? I was too. I, I really was. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, I'm, I'm actually very embarrassed about it. Uh, that, yeah. That I, I would go back to that even knowing mm-hmm. better. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that's how powerful a lie this is. Give it up, people. Give it up. Yeah, let it go. Okay, well, thank you again uh, so much, Cliff, and uh, we will definitely have you back on okay. sometime in the future to talk about any number of other things. <laughs> I think I've ticked off about twenty different things that I would love to discuss with you for. for oh, sure. So sure. Uh, uh, we'll. Uh, We'll have you back on and uh, have a great night. Okay, you too. Child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping. The angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our King. Yeah.
You've been listening to Beyond Extraordinary with Natalina. For the latest headlines and program schedule please visit ExtraordinaryIntelligence.com.